You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, doing an impromptu show here because this is really the only chance that I'll be able to address this for the next two weeks, looking at the calendar. So this actually caught me at a really good time. Um, I just finished up a show and uh, was editing something on YouTube and saw that Dr. White was um, engaging some of my recent material, engaging him. So I wanted to offer some um, pushback and um, uh, critiques of some of the points that he made. Now, I have not watched but only three minutes of the video. Uh, so we're going to do a first impression review. Um, I, I could tell from the three minutes that I saw that this wasn't anything that we needed to prepare, uh, prepare for. And like I said, even if it was, it would be a couple weeks before I'd be able to engage it anyway, but it wasn't, it's something that we can just watch together and I can respond as it goes. Um, I don't know how long my segment is where he engages me. I don't know if it's the full hour video or if it's just like a few minutes and then he moves on to something else, because like I said, I only saw about three minutes of it. Um, but I like doing these first impression reviews and just kind of watching things um, live and offering my live raw commentary. Um, so again, just for the background, he reviewed, or I'm sorry, he um, had a discussion, Dr. White had a discussion with Cameron Bertuzzi. He says Bertuzzi, but I've always thought it was Bertuzzi. I apologize if I've mispronounced his name. Um, with Cameron from Capturing Christianity, they were having a discussion, and I thought it was a very charitable discussion. But as I pointed out, I thought that Dr. White offered very, very weak, um, a very, very weak critique of the Catholic position. And I engaged one of the points, uh, which was the Council of Nicaea and the Sixth Canon. Although pretty much, like I said, every everything else that Dr. White said can and should be challenged. Um, but it would take a good 10 hours to do so. And I'm not going to put 10 hours into reviewing one video. So that's not going to happen. But so just to prove a point, I just engaged one point in a, in a, a video and um, kind of left it at that. Look, if, if he misunderstands things so badly in this area, um, you might want to question some of the other things that he's saying. And uh, yeah, so... I think he is going to offer some engagement with that from the three minutes that I could tell. Um, I heard a little bit of, about that, and I imagine he'll offer some other um, commentary, although it, I got the impression from the three minutes that I saw that he didn't actually watch the video. Um, I got the impression that he heard somebody else probably talk about it, and he read my Twitter message, and that was it. I, I didn't get the impression that he watched the video. If he did, then he completely missed some key points. Um, so I'll point that out when we watch it. So let's um, let me share the screen. And, you know, once again, I, I appreciate Dr. White. I've always appreciated him. I know some of y'all, some of my fellow Catholics don't like Dr. White. Look, um, I think that some of his critiques of Catholicism aren't good but I've actually appreciated a significant amount of his content, especially on textual criticism and engaging people like Bart Ehrman and others. Um, that being said, I have some very serious critiques of Dr. White. Um, <clears throat> so I do appreciate the engagement that he offered, but I immediately heard some very problematic uh, responses. So I think it's worth engaging in. Caught me at a really good time because like I said, it'd be a couple weeks before I'll be able to do it. All right, so uh, let me know if y'all can't hear it. I got it pulled up. Looks like you did this stream an hour ago. I mean, this is raw. This just came out. Which, by the way, that um, that studio is looking good. That's looking good. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to envy a little bit. <laughs> let, me, let me not start to covet here, but uh, it's, it's looking nice. It, it's looking crystal clear, too. Uh, although his camera is normally pretty clear anyway, but it, it looks really good here. Uh, so, all right, let's uh, let's begin. 
program today. And by the way, we're we're at the seven minute mark. So let's begin. Uh, just noting the amazing responses. Now, now you got to understand something. The discussion between non-Roman Catholics and Roman Catholics, and non-Roman Catholics would include Eastern Orthodox, actually, um, on the subject of the papacy has been going on for a very, very long time uh, in regards to the uh, East-West split. Uh, you're coming up on a, on a thousand years. And as far as Reformation, you're talking 500 years, and it's not... Look, this is, this is trivial, and it's not really related to our video, but I just have to stop there. It's not a thousand years. It's not a thousand years. Please just stop with the 1054. Please stop with the 1054. Um, we, we can talk about really a long series of slow breakups between... Uh, Catholics and Orthodox. I don't really like saying East-West here because there are Eastern Catholics, obviously. I'm Eastern Catholic in communion with Rome, so just say, calling it East versus West doesn't really work here. But um, Okay, so really from the second century, you start to have tensions with some of the Eastern churches, um, but not all Eastern churches. Now, that really does start to translate into two different communions where you have Catholics and Orthodox of course, a significant moment is not 1054 or 1053 or 1054, um, but obviously the Fourth Crusade. Fourth Crusade that was a, that was a huge issue, and so setting up parallel jurisdictions there, um, and then the repudiation of the Council of Florence that was a really significant event. But it wasn't really until the um, uh, mid 18th century that you really just have this full break, right? Uh, prior to then, you do have instances of communicatio and sacris taking place um, between Catholics and Orthodox. Although, I mean, there were, there were some significant ruptures, you know, b before 1750s, but uh, it was it was really right around there that you have this thing solidified. So the schism isn't actually as old as as you might think, um, but. Yeah, sure. You you do have Orthodox contesting the papacy well before, um, well before Protestants. But I will note that their perspective of the papacy um, is significantly higher than the Protestant perspective. So they would concede a Petrian prim primacy. You know, Peter among the apostles. They would concede a succession of Peter. They would even say that uh, it's most proper for the Bishop of Rome, they would have a pretty, in fact, you can find among um, historical and especially contemporary quarters in, in Orthodoxy, you can find um, Orthodox ecclesiologies on the papacy that are just, just shy of Vatican I, right? Just shy of Vatican I. But then you can find, you know, others that have a lower view of the, of the papacy. So there is kind of a wide range among the Orthodox, but... Yeah, sure. You 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 have people who contest the papacy, but make no mistake about it, they would concede probably ninety five percent of what we would claim about the papacy. Um, whereas a Protestant would be nowhere near that range. So I don't I don't actually think it's even helpful to bring up the Orthodox in this discussion. I don't think that they they serve its purpose. But let's let's just move forward. Not overly. Uh, I don't think it should be a, a big shock to anyone. Uh, Let me know if, if y'all don't mind. I normally listen to things at two two times the speed um, over here. That might be a little fast for somebody. I don't know. Somebody suggested 1.25. That's fine. We could do that. Um, it, it, but if you feel like that's, that's too fast, just let me know. That uh, non-Roman Catholics do not accept the claims of the Roman Catholic papacy. And, of course, we've, done, we've been doing debates on this. I think the first... Oh... Uh, what was that, 99-ish, maybe? <laughs> Y'all already know what I'm thinking. Um, yeah, yeah, Dr. White has been doing the debate since the 90s, yes. Uh, okay, that's true, that's true, yeah, yeah, that's true. So 93 with Jerry Matitix uh, at Denver Seminary and the Presbyterian Church in Denver, and then uh, uh, Mitch Packle and I, Somewhere in the 90s, uh, did uh, a debate on the papacy as well back on Long Island. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, you know, I think his debates with with Pac were, were, were actually pretty good. Uh, there's there's it's it's not like the, the only big development in regards to the papacy is the obvious degradation of the modern Roman Catholic papacy as far as it being uh, orthodox? No and no. Um, I think a bigger development um, historically, 500 years from now, uh, they, they probably won't remember Pope Francis, but they will remember the abdication of Benedict XVI. I think that's a much more significant um, event. But, okay, yeah, there, you know, here it is, y'all. Rad trads, y'all rad trad Catholics. This is why I critique y'all. This is why I do it. Because I have to listen to this from Protestants. I have to listen to this from Orthodox because I daily engage them. So I have to hear this same stuff from them thrown at me. The same stuff that you're promoting, I have to hear from them. So um, I want you to pay attention to what White is saying. He's going to use your arguments against you. You know how you talk about Pope Francis having a corrupt magisterium teaching heresy? Well, here, here it is. They love that. Whenever you talk about that, Protestants, Orthodox, they love it. Because they just say, yep, we've been saying this for a long time. You're just now catching on. That's why a lot of y'all have become Protestants or Orthodox lately. That's why a lot of y'all have become set of contests and have left communion with Rome. I've been calling this stuff out. I've been addressing it because I hear the stuff from others. Here it is. Um, in Pope Francis's magisterium, he has not taught heresy. I wouldn't even say that he has taught any kind of non-definitive, uh, in any non-definitive authoritative capacity. I wouldn't even say he's taught any errors. Now, we can question prudential judgments and disciplines. Yeah, I have, I have some criticism there. And I also don't think that he's articulated um, in his magisterium his position as clearly as he should, but that's not the same as teaching an error. Um, so we're not even talking about the theological note of um, heresy. We're, we're talking about way lower than heresy. Pope Francis hasn't even engaged in that. But y'all rad trad Catholics that are promoting this garbage online, saying that Pope Francis is teaching heresy, pay attention. L- listen to what your Protestant friends are saying. Roman Catholic? Um, anything like that? And I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, Benedict uh, or even John Paul II, even though I think you can make strong arguments, especially with John Paul, that there were um, differences between the things that he was saying and things that had been said by popes only 50 years earlier. I would also challenge that. I mean, this is exactly what my dissertation is on, so I, I would challenge this. Um, if you can show me an actual reversal, I, I'm not talking about some kind of definitive reversal. We're not talking ex cathedra. We're not talking about infallible definitions. I'm just simply saying, give me a non-definitive reversal. Just give me that. I mean, yeah, if you if you could point to some kind of reversal of a definitive teaching, great. I, I don't think that there could be, but um, hey, sure. Yeah, if you can point one out, I'd love to see it. But I'd be happy to just see a non-definitive one. So I, I would challenge what Dr. White is saying there. I haven't seen anything in John Paul II's um, magisterium, Benedict's magisterium, um, Pope Francis's magisterium, the magisterium of any of the popes, po- post-conciliar popes that could be a full-blown actual magisterial reversal. But if if there actually is one, I need to know because that's what I'm writing my dissertation on. I really need to know. Again, I, I know potential um, examples that people offer, but in each of the cases, I don't see a necessary contradiction. Um, so I, I don't, I don't buy them yet, but of course, if you could show me a reversal of a non-definitive teaching, it would matter anyway. It's non-definitive. It it can technically be reversed. So, I mean, it wouldn't invalidate the claims of the Catholic magisterium. What would invalidate our claims is if you have, um, something definitive being reversed, that would, that would invalidate. At that point, I would no longer be Catholic. I would leave. I'd go back to orthodoxy or Protestantism, one of the two. Um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be Catholic if you could show that. But Francis has, I mean, there are Roman Catholics who put out videos about being red-pilled. Uh, yeah, y'all hear that, Red Trads? Pay attention, because they're paying attention to you. They're listening to you, and they're using your content against you. Pay attention. 
in regards to papacy and Francis. And, and there's a tremendous amount of discussion of what his amazing pontificate has, uh, has indicated. These are not... No, I wouldn't describe it as amazing. <laughs> I, I do think Pope Francis's pontificate um, borders on a failure, in my opinion. But if it's not already there, uh, that being said, I respect him. And I'm not going to say that he has uh, taught error because I haven't seen it. So I'm not going to say that until I actually see it uh, substantiated. I'm not going to just take it for granted. Uh, but that being said, yeah, I, I don't I don't necessarily think that this has been a successful um, uh, pontificate. So I, I definitely wouldn't describe it as amazing. That's for sure. Easy days for Roman Catholic apologists, because obviously the defense of the papacy today um, is is either we're just not going to talk about anything that Francis is. You know why it's difficult for some Roman Catholic apologists because they don't have an understanding of the magisterium. And this is what I've been saying all along. This is why I got into magisterial studies because I realized the deficiency in my own understanding, um, and I realized how pertinent it was to the very issues that are going on today. How are you going to make sense of Pope Francis's pontificate, or really just any any of the post conciliar popes? Um, how are you going to make sense of it? You're going to have to have a serious understanding of the magisterium to be able to really grapple with some of these difficulties. There are difficulties, but none of them rise to the level of, you know, like I said, a reversal or, or anything that would invalidate the papal claims or the Catholic claims as a whole. Um, but for an apologist who doesn't really understand the ins and outs of the magisterium, yeah, they're going to be befuddled. They're going to be confused and they're going to find this pontificate very, very hard to explain in light of Catholic claims about the magisterium, um, which which I think is sad uh, because it 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 doesn't actually prove Protestants right, but it makes it look like we can't defend what's going on in the current pontificate in light of our claims about the magisterium. And in fact, we can. We just need to have a better understanding um, of the magisterium. So this is, this is exactly why I got into. Well, one of the reasons why I got into magisterial studies, among among others saying uh francis hasn't said anything infallible and we just don't want to talk about those things uh, but so we don't even have to go to that you you don't have to you don't have to pull the well pope francis hasn't taught anything definitive card you, you don't and again you'll notice he says he hasn't taught anything infallible teachings are not infallible organs of the magisterium are infallible teachings are irreformable or you could say teachings are definitive and organs are also definitive that can be used interchangeably teachings are irreformable Organs of the magisterium are infallible. Um, so just, I, again, I only quibble over the terms that he's using there to prove my point that um, Dr. White doesn't have even an elementary understanding of the intri intricacies of the magisterium, um, which is why he offers the arguments. Well, one of the reasons why he offers the arguments about Catholicism that he offers, he, he has a deficient understanding of the magisterium. And you know what? Um, so do a lot of Catholics, which is why he's probably going to sound convincing to some of y'all until you hear me respond and explain uh, why he's wrong. Uh, seems to be the uh, the way that people are handling things. Anyway, the responses. Oh, but but back to what I was saying, as far as you don't have to pull that he, he hasn't taught anything definitive card. You don't have to pull that one. I mean, it's it's true, but um, I think you could just point out he hasn't also taught anything non-definitively and authoritatively that's erroneous. And what we're saying about the indefectibility of the church pertains to, yes, ex cathedra teachings, sure. Um, also definitive conciliar teachings. Also definitive proposals of the ordinary and universal magisterium. And then also a general guidance of even the non-definitive magisterium and not only its teachings on faith and morals, but also its disciplinary decrees. That's something that a lot of rad trads don't pick up on. The disciplinary decrees of the church are safe. And in that sense, um, they they could be free from error. If, if we're considering error here, something harmful to souls, if that's how we define error. Um, they can be reversed. Um, they might not be the most prudent and the most timely, but... Um, they're, they're, they're not harmful to souls. They are safe to souls. So our, our claim to indefectibility is actually a pretty broad 
claim. It's not limited to, well, he hasn't taught anything infallible, as he said. Um, he hasn't taught anything ex cathedra. We don't, we don't even have to pull that card, but actually our claims about indefectibility are much broader than that. They're, they're not just limited to ex cathedra definitions. They're, they're actually broader than that. But you can't even point me to one non-definitive teaching of Pope Francis that's in error, Dr. White. Not even one. Good luck trying. I, I'd love to see one. Um, I've dealt with all of the stereotypical ones, of more satitia, uh, death penalty, and other issues like that. And I'm, I'm not seeing a rupture in the doctrine here. <sighs> all right, let's continue. We're, we're truly amazing because, like I said, nothing much has changed. Um, but I was directed first to some comments, and I'm not sure that um, – yeah, let me let me see here real quickly. I was uh, yeah, I, I was directed to this comment by uh, Michael Lofton, who I am told has recently, in some way, joined Catholic Answers. I'm, I'm not sure if that means as a contributor, staff person. I, I don't know. I yeah, it's an affiliate apologist. If you go to the Catholic Answers website and just type in Michael Lofton, um, it should come up. Um, yeah, just working with them part-time. I mean, obviously I'm still doing and and, and I'm going to continue to do reason and theology full-time, but working with Catholic Answers part-time as a contributor, and then also um, now under contract to write a book on Orthodoxy and Catholicism. We already have a million books on Catholicism, Protestantism. Um, we now need one on Catholicism and Orthodoxy. And that's not to take away any of the books that are out there on Catholicism and Protestantism. I'm just saying there's no point in me adding just another one. There's nothing that I could really offer there that I would think that would be significant enough to write a book about. But I do think that there's a lacuna to fill when it comes to the Catholic and Orthodox dialogue, which is really where my heart is. Um, the discussions between Catholics and Protestants are, are a little bit more remote for me. Obviously, I care about Protestants and, and, and want to see um, Delmi communion with Christ Church. Most certainly, but I, I think that my heart is really for the Orthodox Catholic dialogue. But I'll I'll still talk about you know Protestantism on, on the side here and there. But I, I really think that we need more content between Catholics and Orthodox because there's just not a lot out there. So yeah, writing a book for them. So y'all, um, y'all be on the lookout for that. I haven't found anything specifically on that, but. Uh... He's done something called Reason and Theology for quite some time. Here's what he wrote. He said, so much misinformation and softball arguments from James White today in his discussion with Cameron Bertuzzi. I imagine most educated Catholics are shaking their heads at this moment. For example, And I stand by that. I stand by that. The Catholics that are more informed about the magisterium and church history would be shaking their heads. And I'm going to show why. Not that I didn't already show why with the Canon 6 issue, but... I'm going to show why here um, with the uh, rest of the comments that he offers, which I've only seen about the next one minute, maybe. <laughs> so I don't, beyond the one minute, I don't really know what else he says, but we'll, we'll engage those two. Example, the claim made about Canon 6 from Nicaea. With all due respect, Dr. White, an educated Catholic can offer better arguments than this against Catholicism and don't utilize straw men and misinformation. And I stand by that. I can offer way better criticisms of the Catholic Church than anything Dr. White has offered. And you know what? It, it could be that Catholicism is wrong. You know, maybe Catholicism is wrong. Okay. But it's not wrong because of any of the reasons that Dr. White has shown. It, if it's wrong, we wouldn't know it because of Dr. White. In other words, that's what I'm trying to say. There's way, way stronger arguments against Catholicism. Um from several angles, in my opinion. Uh, perhaps we can get into them in, a, in another video. Wow. Okay. So, so bad was I that evidently he couldn't sleep. No. Um, it, it was bad, but no, it had nothing to do with a lack of sleep, although I did post kind of late that night. Um, but it had, it had absolutely nothing to do with how bad the video would uh, was. It had everything to do with the fact that I knew I wouldn't be able to address it the next day. And I was being hounded by patrons and non-patrons asking for me to respond uh, to Dr. White. 
that's where it came from. And I'm like, about the only time I, I can really do it is, is now because I know I won't be able to do it the next day. Um, because I mean, that it was, was that yesterday or the day before? I remember the next day was going to be just swamped. Was it going to be able to do it? Um, and like I said, people were just harassing me. You need to respond to this as soon as you can, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, all right, fine, whatever. I'll just do it, do a short video here. I didn't intend for it to be an hour long, but y'all know how it goes. So <laughs> I intend to do a five minute video. It turns out to be three hours. Uh, <laughs> this Michael Lofton. And so he ended up putting out an over an hour long video that night. On the yeah. Subject. But, um, but frankly, Dr. White, I mean, an hour is kind of short for me. If, <laughs> I know you don't watch my channel and you didn't even watch my critique of you. I would say, but um, an hour is actually not long for <laughs> because on, on, honestly, I mean, in a lot of these discussions, there's, there are, there are a lot of distinctions that are involved and, and you, there are some things that can't be settled in, you know, Twitter, Twitter sized forums, right? There are some, there are some views out there that require lengthier engagements than 120 characters. Is that how many characters you have in Twitter? I don't know. Of uh, the sixth canon of the Council of Nicaea. And for those of you who didn't catch the discussion, I mentioned it uh, to Cameron as an example um, I bet you I know exactly what's uh, going on there. As an example of the fact that, uh, yeah, I, I knew that was going to happen. Um, sorry. Uh, that at the time of the Council of Nicaea, why was there a Council of Nicaea? I, see, I don't even think he's going to even address my point, which was the argument that he was offering is that it was speaking about a limited jurisdiction in Canon 6 of Nicaea. Um, for the Bishop of Rome. And so he wants to say, okay, you see, that invalidates the claims of Pastor Eternus in Vatican I, uh, which testifies to a universal jurisdiction being known in every age. Um, again, I distinguish between the kind of jurisdiction that Vatican I is speaking about and the kind of jurisdiction that Nicaea is speaking about. Um, you have a more metropolitical or patriarchal jurisdiction being discussed in Nicaea 6, which is obviously going to be limited. The Pope is not the patriarch of the world. He's not the bishop of the world. He's not the metropolitan of the world. He's not a bishop in every single diocese. That would be absurd. Obviously, he wears different hats, multiple hats, and can function in multiple capacities. Um, his universal jurisdiction only applies to him acting as a universal shepherd and pastor. It has nothing to do with his jurisdiction as far as a metropolitan or a patriarch. That was my point. I don't even think he watched the video. Now I think he's about to talk about, um, you know, what was the even the point of bringing up the, the Council of Nicaea? So let's see where he goes with it. Why, if, if, the, if the church believed that the Bishop of Rome was the infallible vicar of Christ on earth, then why do you need councils at all? Mm -hmm. See, this is why I said he didn't watch the video. Because I expressly said in that video why that's the case. Y'all remember that? The discussion we had about Pope Leo? Why did Pope Leo consent to an ecumenical council, the Council of Chalcedon, after he already gave a definitive judgment and believed his judgment was definitive? Why? If you watch the video, you would know. If you didn't watch the video, you'll continue to ask the same questions, which just continues to prove my point, and that is Dr. White, after 30 years of engagement with Catholics, is not actually listening to what the other side has to offer. And he's not listening to any kind of criticisms of his own position. He's just in repeat mode, repeat mode. Back in 96, I had this debate with Jerry Maddox. Back in 97, I, I was debating at the Hilton and blah, blah, blah. And he's just in repeat mode. And then, and then when I asked, are you the blessed man? They said, I hope to be. And it's just the same stories, the same stories over and over and over. Nothing, no new information. Just put them on repeat. Put them on repeat. Proves my point. He's not listening. And this isn't an anomaly. It's not like, well, he just didn't listen to that point, or maybe he just didn't grasp it. No, this is stuff that just habitually happens with Dr. Wine. He's not really listening. I answered that question already. For those of y'all who have not seen the video, the reason why Leo offers a definitive judgment, um, but then acquiesces or 
not acquiesce is bad that phrase there but consents to the calling of an ecumenical council after he's already offered a definitive judgment why an ecumenical council well he tells you tells you why so that a fuller judgment may be expressed and then i asked well how is it that you could have a fuller judgment that's something that's already definitive remember when i discussed that in the previous video and what was my answer to that what was the answer not fuller in so far as you're going to get a greater definitive judgment definitive is definitive but you can have a fuller expression of it um and it's much more fitting that you would have a fuller expression than just the Bishop of Rome offering a definitive judgment in some cases. It's much more fitting that you would have concord with the bishops throughout the world where they place their placet beside um, the judgment. Or that, as is more ordinarily the case, they offer a judgment prior to the Pope offering a judgment. And the Pope, Pope just kind of ratifies it, and that's it. It's not normal for the Pope to issue a definitive judgment and for the bishops to then just offer their uh, approbation. It's usually the other way around. <clears throat> and that is because it's more fitting, again, that you would have a fuller, fuller expression. So that's why. That's why you would have ecumenical councils. And that's why it's much more fitting that you would have that instead of them just going to the Bishop of Rome. But I have something else to tell you about that here in a moment. But I'll, I'll wait for the last point that I heard from the video, uh, which I think is coming up here in about 20 seconds. And especially on a specific doctrinal issue, because let's see, less than 200 years later, mm -hmm. the Bishop of Rome, Honorius, mm -hmm. is going to have discussions with, as I recall, Sergius, his counterpart on, in the East. Yeah, Patriarch Sergius. On the subject of whether Christ had one or two wills. Mm -hmm. Now, let's be honest, the vast majority of Christians have never even given it a thought. Mm. And Yeah, how sad, right? wouldn't know how to answer the question with any sense of confidence. Which is very, very sad. Um, of getting it right by whoever standard you're going to be going with, mm -hmm. uh, let alone have a discussion of it from a biblical perspective. Mm -hmm. But this, Which is sad, especially for Catholics. Was the, because I really, I really don't think that most Catholics would be able to offer good reasons for diothelitism. Um, but, okay. The monothelitism, duothelitism debate Duothelitism? I haven't heard it called that before. Maybe maybe it is. I usually hear it called dialothelitism. And uh, Honorius was clearly a monothelite. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Really? Huh. Which is why Maximus the Confessor wrote an apology for him and said that he wasn't. Which is why a successor to Honorius... Pope John IV, prior to the Sixth Council, wrote an entire apology for Honorius, showing that he wasn't a monothelite. That's interesting. That's interesting. Now, how do we account for that, given the judgment of the Sixth Council? Well, we've we've discussed that at length. You know, we we can we can reinvent the wheel and rehash that, or I could just refer you to previous videos on Honorius that I've, I've already done. We've spoken about that at length. Um, maybe it's time for us to do another updated, um, uh, video, but, um, weighed in on there a lot. There's actually multiple ways that you could go with the sixth council on that issue. But, but let's, let's just concede for the moment that, that he was a monothelite, even though you actually don't have to adopt that position, um, notwithstanding the, the judgment of the sixth ecumenical council and, um, the anathemas that some of the popes um, made whenever they took the papal office. You actually don't have to maintain the position that he he technically was a, a, a monothelite, and even in, in light of the Six Ecumenical Council. Now you do have to you do have to um, dogmatically maintain that monothelitism is heresy. You do have to accept that accept that. But um, our um, Judgments on individual persons considered irreformable in the magisterium? No, unless that judgment is a secondary object of infallibility and is absolutely essential to preserve in order to preserve a primary object, something that's part of divine revelation. 
which there's nothing in divine revelation that's necessary um, for me to be able to say Pope Honorius was a heretic for me to be able to preserve something in divine revelation. There's just nothing necessary there, right? So clearly this isn't a secondary object. Therefore, uh, the Sixth Ecumenical Council's judgment on Honorius is, is not something that's irreformable, right? Um, but even if you want to accept that um, personally, Honorius was a monotheolite. That's okay. You can accept that position too. That's also not incompatible with the claims we make about the magisterium and papal infallibility. It's it's actually possible to maintain that uh, personally um, a pope could be a heretic and yet um, papal infallibility can still be preserved. And uh, we can talk about that one at length, which again, we've already done in previous videos. So I'll just kind of table it there, but much can be said. But you, you notice how many assumptions he's making? He made an assumption that he's a monothelite. Actually, there's really good evidence historically to say he wasn't. But even if you want to accept the um, reformable judgment of the Council um, of Constantinople three, okay, that's fine. That has absolutely nothing to do with Catholic claims to indefectibility. Uh, zero. None. None whatsoever. And he communicated that in his uh, letters as the Bishop of Rome. Well, yes, yes, as, as the Bishop of Rome. I understand that. I totally get that. Yeah, he wasn't speaking as a private person, right? He, he wasn't speaking as a private theologian. Um, he was speaking as the Bishop of Rome. Does that now somehow invalidate the claims made at Vatican I as understood by the fathers at Vatican I? No. Does it invalidate the claims to indefectibility that are made at the same council, the Sixth Ecumenical Council? <laughs> Which you never hear White talk about. It's funny he wants to bring up Honorius as if this somehow invalidates the claims to papal infallibility. And yet, the claim to papal infallibility is being made by the fathers who are condemning Honorius. Why is that, Dr. White? How is it that the council fathers can accept Agatho's letter to the emperor, which asserts papal infallibility, and is read out loud to the council fathers? They can accept that, and then in a later session, also say Honorius is a heretic, and yet still not deny papal infallibility. Why? Why? Oh, that's because they have a particular understanding of papal infallibility that accounts for people who have heresy, um, uh, even if they're a pope, right? They were able to make distinctions between um, a pope definitively binding someone to heresy versus a pope uttering heresy. They're able to make that distinction, which is a distinction that we make today, and it's not an illegitimate distinction. It's a very significant one. And it's not an after the fact kind of thing, but we're, we're getting way off track. But I just want to point out the fact that why even bring up Honorius when you haven't even addressed the fact that those same council fathers that condemn Honorius also wrote back to Pope Agatho and told him that his words were accepted. They accepted it at the council. Everything was great. They're divinely inspired, according to the council fathers which Agatha is not even offering a definitive judgment that's new. He's just reiterating the definitive judgment of Pope Martin at Lateran 1. All right, we're getting way off track. But I just want to say that Dr. White's knowledge of church history is deficient, and that's why he offers arguments like this. And if he had a better understanding of church history, and I know he's taught courses on them, but as I said, it tends to be very superficial content. When you have a better understanding of, of church history, you're not going to make arguments like this. You just you can't use the Six Ecumenical Council to somehow try to say this is against our claims to papal infallibility when it's that same council that actually accepts papal infallibility. It's, it's a horrible argument. If you're going to argue against papal infallibility, use a different argument. For hundreds of years later, after that time period, every man who became, unless you accept the theory of Pope Joan, but that's a whole different topic. Um, is he seriously putting that? Is he seriously putting that forward? I mean, I hope not. <laughs> Which is not one that I would get into. Um, but uh, Very wise decision, Dr. White. Uh, 
every person that became, um, I, we just live in such a weird, every non-birthing person <laughs> that became, um, <laughs> It's, it's sad. I mean, that's, that's, that would have never crossed my mind only a few years ago, but here we are. What? Here we are. Um, anyway, every person who was... I enjoy his sense of humor, but I have no idea what he's talking about right now. ...ascended the papal throne, had to, as part of the swearing in, uh, anathematize Honorius as a heretic. Mm -hmm. The Bishop of Rome, mm -hmm. as a heretic. Mm -hmm. for his Yeah, right which the council fathers did, the same council fathers who also believed that the See of Rome was indefectible in its teaching on this. Just let that one sink in before you use that argument again. His monothelitism. <clears throat> so these are facts. And yeah, the Sixth Council did believe that he was a monothelite. They did not even examine the apology of John IV. Didn't even examine it. Wasn't even considered. Did they make an error there? I'll let you make a judgment on whether they made a factual error about the person of Honorius. It's most certainly possible. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. They did not make an error in the teaching, um, but maybe they did, maybe they did it in its factual decision um, on the person of Honorius. Again, I'll, I'll let you make that judgment. These, these are. This is reality. The point is, there is a minor point, a relatively minor point of theology at a later point in church history. But the Bishop of Rome was held accountable for it. Why didn't you just go to the Bishop of Rome in 325? That's when I stopped the video. <laughs> That's when I stopped the video. Even, even though I had already answered that in the previous video, and if he had watched it, he would have heard that answer already. I just want you to think of that, about that for a second. Do y'all remember the video that I did on, on I think it was four, four church fathers or something like that to testify to the papacy or the papal claims or something like that? And I go over Pope Julius, but also at the very end go over Athanasius. Remember that? If you haven't seen that video, go and watch it. Because here's an interesting point. Guess what? Athanasius makes that very claim. Athanasius makes the very claim that we didn't even need the Council of Nicaea because the Bishop of Rome had already decided the matter of the deity of Christ. Why is Dr. White making this point? Why, why is he arguing this if he knows church history? He has taught church history. But here's a guy who has taught church history in, in a Protestant communion, not, not in any kind of Catholic institutions or anything like that. But in a Protestant community, he's taught church history. And yet, he doesn't realize that that very claim was made by Athanasius. Just, just let that sink in for a second. Athanasius uses that argument against you. And he says, yeah, we didn't even need the Council of Nicaea. We already have a definitive judgment from the Bishop of Rome. Back in, was it 252? Am I off in my dates there? 252? About 70 years prior to Nicaea. Now, obviously, Arius wasn't alive, right? Um, but he was condemning an equivalent position that it was already being espoused in the mid third century. And he had already offered a judgment. So Athanasius says, Arius's view has already been condemned. We didn't even need the Council of Nicaea. Now, I would still say, yeah, but you know. <laughs> I get where you're coming from, St. <laughs> Athanasius. Totally get where you're coming from. But don't you think it's more appropriate that we have a fuller judgment offered than just the Bishop of Rome's decision here? I mean, don't you think it's a little bit more fitting that you would have the bishops of the world, if it's possible to gather them together, that they would offer their definitive approval and backing of this? Of course, of course. And I'd, I, he wouldn't argue with that. Of course, he would say yes. Um, but very technically speaking, do we need the Council of Nicaea? No, and Athanasius points that out. But yes, it's fitting that you would have a Council of Nicaea. Frankly, you didn't even need the Bishop of Rome to offer a definitive judgment. The ordinary and universal magisterium prior to the definition of Nicaea, um, and I would even say prior to the judgment of Rome, 
the ordinary and universal magisterium was already teaching the deity of Christ, and it was already proposing it, um, I would argue definitively, in its preaching, and its oral proclamation. Um, sacred scripture, I think, is explicit on it. Do you really need a definition on the deity of Christ? I mean, to, to me, it's it's explicit enough, right? Um, scripture, that is. So it's kind of like, do we even need a magisterial intervention here? Um, but the Arians were using scripture to back up their position illegitimately, right? They weren't legitimately using it. But they were using things like Proverbs 8 to back up their position that Jesus was a created being. And since that did bring a lot of... Um, Confusion. It was it was fitting that you would have an explicit definitive judgment by the magisterium at that point. <sighs> We're getting way off track here, but this is the kind of stuff that I would like to see Dr. White engage. But in order to do that, he has to listen to what other people say in response to his content, and it doesn't seem that he's doing that. And go, hey, there's this big controversy going on. You know, you go over the history and. You, know, you, you tell what Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria has done, Alexandria has done, and the actions of councils in Egypt and just have him make a decision. They have done that. They did have him make a decision in the mid-third century. Um, however, it's more fitting that you would have a fuller judgment by the bishops. Um, especially on a particular version at that point of the denial of the deity of Christ, Arius is a version at that point. It would be helpful to address that specifically. Um, so again, I see, I still don't think that this is a good argument because that was already done. And even afterwards, you have the East writing to Rome asking for definitive judgments on matters of faith and morals without an ecumenical council, just bypassing the conciliar process and just asking for a definitive judgment from Rome, while also recognizing that it, the council, a uh, universal council, could offer a definitive judgment. So they recognize these two modes or two organs and two modes by which the church can teach definitively. They they recognize both, um, and there's there's reasons why Christ instituted a church that has two different modes. Um, they're in, in two different organs that can exercise people and fallibility. Um, but that's discussion for another day. Because he knows, right? He's the infallible vicar of Christ. Um, yeah, so th this is just, again, empty rhetoric, rhetoric because, again, the, the concept of papal infallibility was was already there. Um, if, if they believe that the Bishop of Rome could offer a definitive judgment on faith and morals, what do you think that is? What do you think that is? And especially if they're locating it in the fact that this is based on Christ's promise to Peter and his successor and locating it in Matthew 16. What do you think that is? That's called papal infallibility. That's exactly what that is. The the seed that the substance of the teaching is there, which is why you have Orthodox scholars and theologians that admit that the papal claims, in, including papal infallibility, were being uttered in the first millennium. At even the ecumenical councils, you have Orthodox scholars who admit that. They don't agree. They don't agree, but they admit that, yeah, those things were being uttered. Why is that? Why would an Orthodox concede that if there's just nothing there for papal infallibility, as Dr. White would have you believe here with this empty rhetoric? It's, um, it's just not a very well-informed position, and I would like to see him engage a more informed position. I'd really be curious to hear what he has to offer. I'm sure he'll come up with some good responses. He usually does whenever he listens to his interlocutors, but he's not listening. He's just not hearing. He's not, he doesn't have all of the data. He doesn't have all of the information. And I would like to hear what he would think once he's accounted for the rest of the information. But that's not what happened. And in fact, as all even semi-unbiased uh, church history records would tell you, uh, the Bishop of Rome had basically nothing to do with the proceedings uh, at the Council of Nicaea. Oh, and I also want to say this. Um, even though the claims to papal indefectibility in its teaching office were being proclaimed in the first millennium very early on, I will say this. 
Um, were there some in the first millennium that did not believe those claims? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe even some of the council fathers that heard those things. Some of them cried out in acclamation and, and yes, consented. Um, I imagine some of the fathers, some of these councils rejected some of the papal claims that they were hearing by the papal legates. Um, and that they see that the council is adopting. I imagine some of them may have even rejected some some aspects to the papal claims. Um, that doesn't really mean anything because you also have some of the council fathers at Nicaea 1 that would have rejected the deity of the Holy Spirit. Does that somehow invalidate their judgment about Nicaea uh, 1 and, and the deity of, of Jesus? No, of course not. Um, uh, but it, So I, I would say you, you do have those in, in the first millennium that would have rejected the papal claims. Yeah, yeah. But you also have people that would reject the Trinity and um, the deity of the Holy Spirit and the Chalcedonian definition. Um, the existence of dissent doesn't really disprove orthodoxy or that a um, truth was handed down by the apostles. Right. I mean, you have people that actually deny things that Scripture teaches. Right. So just because somebody denies something doesn't doesn't really mean anything. You have the Gnostics denying all kinds of things and denying entire books of Scripture. Does that somehow mean that Scripture is invalidated because you have the existence of the Gnostics? Of course not. And it was the council that made the decision in regards to the creedal statement concerning the nature of Christ and whether he is homoousios of the same substance, heterousios of a different substance, or homoousios, the middle of the road position uh, that was presented there, as well as the fact that the, the council of about 318 mainly Eastern bishops, uh, there were two representatives, history says anyways, uh, from Rome, uh, concerning other issues relating to church, order, polity, all the, all the councils did that kind of thing. And so I guess his argument is because you had little participation from the bishop of Rome, that somehow means something? I mean, surely he's heard of Constantinople I, right? How much participation from Rome do you have at Constantinople I? Zero. You don't even have papal legates there. Do we hold the 381 as ecumenical? Yeah. So that means... Serious participation from Rome is not actually necessary for something to be a definitive judgment. Yeah. 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 Mere papal ratification as something that is universally promulgated can be sufficient to say that something is, is a universal judgment. Just mere, mere ratification as something that's to be universally promulgated. Um, even if materially... No bishop of Rome is there. No papal legate is there. No Western bishops are there. I mean, you have a very, very minor contingency at 381. Very, very small group of Eastern bishops. Were there any Western bishops at 381? I don't even remember. I don't, I don't recall. I don't think so. If there were, it was something you could count on one hand. I, I actually don't think that there were any Western bishops representatives there most certainly weren't papal legates and and there wasn't obviously the bishop of rome there so what does this argument have to do with our claims again i'm confused what does this actually mean i think there were there were canons and decrees that all these councils promulgated and in some later situations especially when it had to do again with the growing papal power uh some of those uh canons are disputed and uh, you know 28th canon chalcedon stuff like that. anyway Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The 28th canon of Chalcedon. Yeah, the one that Leo disputed and the one that wasn't even accepted in the West until centuries later. And the one that the Patriarch of Constantinople wrote to Leo about and completely bowed down to Leo's rejection of canon 28 with the authority of St. Peter. And the Patriarch just completely agreed and said, you have that, that authority. That canon 28. How does that help your case? That makes your case worse. Canon 28 is like the worst argument that you can offer for either orthodoxy or Protestantism. 
It's one of the worst arguments. It's a very strong argument for the papal claims. It's a terrible argument for anything else. You know, notwithstanding the accommodating argument that you can make that, you know, Dvornik talks about in relation to Constantinople I's canon and canon 28, the accommodating principle that I've spoken about in previous videos and addressed. You know, notwithstanding that, canon 28 is actually a very strong argument for the papal claims. Why even bring it up? So... I just raised the, the simple historical reality. Now, it's funny because I remember back in the 90s, and by the way, nothing has changed since the 90s. <laughs> A whole lot has changed since the 90s, Dr. White. You know what has changed? People have listened to your debates for 30 years. People like myself have listened to pretty much everything you've put out there on, on Catholicism and have accounted for your content. That doesn't mean we're right. People who have listened to your stuff, they could be wrong. I could be wrong. Catholicism could be wrong. But what I'm saying is you haven't adequately shown that Catholicism is wrong. And you haven't adequately engaged Catholicism. Um, maybe this stuff worked 30 years ago, and maybe it still works today for people who don't know church history or the magisterium. This does not work for educated Catholics, though. For people who are much more informed about this particular area. Now, obviously, you can have educated Catholics who are not informed in this area. What I meant by educated Catholics in that Twitter post and Facebook is educated in this area, in this area, the magisterium and church history. That's what I meant. Yeah, I didn't qualify literally every every adjective in there, but um, that's what I meant by educated Catholic. As a person who's well informed of church history and the magisterium, these are outdated arguments. You need to you need to account for feedback and come up with some better criticisms, which I know Dr. White is capable of. I know he's capable of much better uh, critiques against Catholicism than what he's putting forward. He just doesn't realize that there's a need to put forward better arguments against Catholicism because he's not listening to feedback. Nothing. Uh, it, according, to, according to Michael Lofton, people in the 90s, whether Catholic or Protestant, I didn't have a clue what they were talking about. Evan That's not what I was saying. But what I am saying, again, is... Most of what was being discussed is not accounting for a great deal of more data and evidence that is available. It was available then, but not necessarily in the English language. Now, you have a whole lot more available now in the English language than you did in the 90s. But unless you were some kind of Latin scholar and you were reading the particular sources that I have in mind, you probably wouldn't be aware of some of this content. Unless you're reading the ACTA of some of these ecumenical councils in their original languages, you, you probably just wouldn't be aware of it. Um, so, yeah, no, I'm not just saying that there was nothing good back in the night. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is most of that stuff is outdated. There, there are better responses to those criticisms that need to be accounted for. That's what I'm saying. I watched those 90 debates. I've watched all of his Catholic debates since then. Um, and I learned a lot. So I'm not saying that there's just have no profit. I learned a lot. The first time I ever heard of Cyprian was from James White in a debate. He kept talking about this guy named Cyprian. It was going off about Cyprian and Cyprian and, and Cyprian and Cyprian. And, uh, I'm thinking, who is this Cyprian guy? What? <laughs> Had to go and learn church history. Evidently, it's only his generation that is that is understood and has had a had a had a grasp. No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the current generation um, is much more likely to have accounted for what you were arguing in the 90s than the people at that time. You know why? Because we've had 30 years to account for what you've been arguing. The people in the 90s didn't have 30 years to think through those arguments. It was contemporary for them at that point. That, that's all I'm saying. On the issues related to uh, the papacy and the magisterium of the church. And, and if you had watched my videos and actually listened to my critique instead of just reading a Twitter post, if you had actually listened to what I said, you wouldn't be saying any of this because you would know that there's actually some substance to what I'm offering as far as pushback against what he's saying. It doesn't make me right. I could be wrong. But he would know that there's substantial pushback being offered here, and I need to account for it. And uh, the sixth canon 
the Council of Nicaea. Those of us from, from earlier decades, we just, we didn't have access to the same information. You did, but they were in original languages. Um, a lot of it wasn't translated, as I said. Um, so you you did have access if, if you were able to read them um, in Latin or Greek uh, or Syriac, but you, you, you would not have access to most of what I'm thinking about that would account for a lot of these arguments in the English language. No, no, I stand by that. I absolutely stand by that. Prove me wrong. Don't know. Don't know. Go listen to his video. The first time. Yeah, go listen to it, including yourself, Dr. White, respectfully. You didn't listen to it. If you did, you would have never asked, why would we still need an ecumenical council if you could just go to the Bishop of Rome for a definitive judgment? You would have never brought that up because you would have already heard I offered an answer from Leo himself. 10 minutes of the most condescending display of papal arrogance I've ever seen. Is it actually papal arrogance on my part? Is, is that really what's going on here? I'm not so sure that I'm the arrogant one here. To me, arrogance is to not listen to what your interlocutors are actually saying and then going to critique them in a video on YouTube. You didn't even watch my video, and yet you accuse me of arrogance? Well, I'm at least watching your stuff and addressing it now. I'm at least doing that. I'm offering you while we're watching this live. I'm watching your stuff and interacting with it. You can do that too. You don't have to go and watch my content in advance. Just at least watch it at some point live and offer some feedback. That to me would be, um, it would show goodwill. But a person who's offering a critique to a position that they haven't even listened to and then calling them arrogant, to me, that's arrogant with all due respect. That is arrogant. And yes, that's disrespectful as Kathy Gabe is noting. That's okay. He's my elder. I guess I guess I deserve that, right? Uh, I'm the young guy. Um, but in my opinion, I actually think that arrogance is uh, for a person who doesn't actually listen to interlocutors, but then wants to critique them and thinks that they don't have anything to offer. Aside from the fact that you didn't even understand what my point was and what you're accusing me about arrogance about is actually not what I was saying. Um, so you've, you've misrepresented me. You falsely judged me. I don't appreciate that at all. I've ever, it's just astonishing. I mean, it, it is astonishing if I were guilty of what you accuse me of, but I'm not. What's astonishing is your behavior right now. It just drips with, we are so superior. And no, no, I don't believe Catholics are superior. I do, however, think that there are superior arguments than the arguments you've offered. Yes, I, I stand by that. There are superior arguments than what you have presented. That doesn't make Catholics right. And we know so much. And, and nobody, I, this is just so simple. That's that's absurd because, again, most of the sources that I learned from are, are pretty ancient. Um, so I, I actually tremendously value the past and put much less regard to more contemporary resources in, in most cases, right? Um, most instances. What I'm talking about here is um, newer resources is, is just English translations of the acts of the ecumenical councils. So anyway, the, the, the whole point in um, making reference to this is there is so much that when, and remember what the overarching point I was making to uh, Cameron was, Rome has a dogmatic position. Whether the current Pope believes this or not, I don't know. He hasn't commented directly on it. I would not be shocked or surprised at all. He, he actually has commented um, on this. He says he accepts all the dogmas of the Catholic Church. He, he has said that. So unless you're going to say he's a liar, I take him at his word. If many of the dogmatic statements of the Roman Catholic Church in the past that Roman Catholic apologists at Catholic Answers defended in the 1990s, early 2000s. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Francis does not believe them. Again, he's explicitly said that he believes all the dogmas of the church. So why, why put that into doubt? But he's probably not going to comment about it. Um, but as, as I had pointed out, 
in the uh, documents that I read, the quotations that I read uh, to, uh, to Cameron from uh, Vatican I and uh, various other sources, including Vatican II. Uh, You'll notice there's no direct reference to my video at this point. Still no direct reference. There's only one direct reference to a Twitter slash Facebook post I made. Only one. No direct engagement with anything I've directly claimed. Only a straw man. In fact, the, the I didn't. I wanted to read this one, but I didn't. But I, let me throw this one in just at the front of it. Um, Cardinal Gibbons had in the faith of our fathers, which is not a dogmatic source, obviously, but um, at the same time, you know, when, when people will simply dismiss someone like a cardinal, it gives you some idea. Anyway. <sighs> where, where do we begin? <laughs> um, Dr. White, frankly, you need a, a, a just a basic introduction to the magisterium. I'm sorry. I know that's going to sound absurd to you because you think that you have a basic understanding of it. No, no. Why, why even say that? Anyways, he said in the faith of our fathers, page 78, the Catholic church teaches that our Lord conferred on St. Peter, the first place of honor and jurisdiction in the government of his whole church. And that same spiritual authority has always resided. And this was the point because Cameron was saying, well, you know, you, you can believe in the papacy, but not necessarily believe in the in a perfect succession and stuff like that no it, it's that. see i've engaged this point specifically as well it, it, dr white is isn't listening he's just not listening um which cameron briefly alluded to it i don't know if he alluded to it because of he saw me address it or if he saw somebody else address it but he briefly alluded to it when he said that that was just kind of you know a rhetorical phrase which i stand by um, that's the same case in Cardinal Gibbons. It's the same case at pa in Pastor Eternus. It's it's um it's a rhetorical phrase to refer to a moral majority, a moral consent. Um, you, as I've pointed out, have the same phenomenon in Scripture, where in the New Testament it talks about all of Judea went out to see John the Baptist. And I know he likes to capitalize on the different ways in which all use is used in the new testament given calvinism so he likes to account for the distinctions here um so all doesn't literally mean every single man uh, which he also has then applications for calvinism um so he recognizes that rhetorical device in scripture why don't you recognize that rhetorical device elsewhere would be my question why are you using this hyper-literalistic interpretation of a phrase that's used there? And of a phrase that actually, if you read it in its context, instead of just alluding to it, as Joe Heschmeyer rightly observed in a stream we had together, it's actually not even technically talking about what he's talking about. But let's move forward. Yes. Um, and that same spiritual authority has always reside in the popes or bishops of Rome as being the successors of St. Peter. Consequently, to be true followers of Christ, all Christians, both among the clergy and laity, must be in communion with the See of Rome where Peter rules in the person of his successor. Mm -hmm. Now, again, modern mm -hmm. uh, Catholics don't have the spine. That mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, see, here's where he would also benefit from listening to Catholics when it comes to how to properly understand Extra Ecclesium Nola Salus. Um, yeah, I accept everything that Gibbon says there. I accept Unum Sanctum. I accept Florence. I accept everything in the patristic era that's about Extra Ecclesium Nola Salus. And then everything in the second millennium as well. And yet I can still say that there are people who are non formal members of the Catholic Church that could be saved. How is that? How is that? because of the d distinction that I just made, which is a distinction that you can find in the patristic era that's actually assumed in the New Testament. And that is levels of culpability and then also formal versus informal membership. Yeah, everybody must be in communion with Christ's church. And in that also sense, by extension, then in communion with the Pope, can you have a communion with Christ's church in an informal, informal way? Yes. And if you want to knock that, 
you're going to have to knock certain New Testament concepts and then first millennium concepts. So this is this is this distinction is not just something novel. It's in accord with a good 2000 years of tradition uh, tr church history when you study the history of extra ecclesium nulla salus. I don't necessarily agree with every point in here, but you can read Francis Sullivan of course on his um historical observation on this doctrine. The historical data is fine. It's just the way that he puts it all together at the end. I would I would phrase it a little differently. Um, I would get to the same conclusion as he does, but a little differently. But the historical evidence is also re really, really helpful. So if you're confused by ex extra ecclesium nulla salus, how, how can we maintain what we maintain in Lumen Gentium? Um, paragraph 14 through 16, how can we maintain those things in light of unum sanctum? Get that book. Also, I did a lecture on um, outside the church, there is no salvation a while back on the channel that you'll also find helpful. Watch that. Um, okay. Gibbons have. They still. Uh, modern Catholics will will do the that that was that was excessive or that was too much or that was what was being taught in those days. Well, again, as he himself rightly notes what Cardinal Gibbons Gibbon himself actually says does, does, doesn't really um, mean a whole lot other than some kind of moral authority. Um, it's not anything authoritative, but I can accept everything you said and still maintain what Lumen Gentium does. How is it? Well, maybe because we're accounting for certain responses to these often repeated arguments that he hasn't accounted for. And in 1896... There was a, a document promulgated called Satis Cognitum. Satis Cognitum. I'm going to read you just this one line from it. Where oh, fun. I, didn't, didn't I tell you all that he was probably getting his stuff from Denny's Papalism? I, th I think I've heard him reference Denny's Papalism, which, of course, is a response to um, uh, Satis Cognitum here. Um, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Let's hear it. For in the decree of the Vatican Council, as to the nature and authority of the primacy of the Roman pontiff. That was Vatican I. No newly conceived opinion is set forth, but the venerable and constant belief of every age. Right, right. Uh, again, and, and I, I maintain that this is the belief that's in every age, even literalistically. Yeah, I, I maintain that. I don't maintain that everyone in the every age maintained those things. But I can say the same thing about, you know, the deity of the of Holy Spirit and, and, and the deity of Christ. And yet I can also say the deity of Christ was maintained in every age. Right? What do we mean by that? Do we mean to the man? No. I think wasn't it Eric Ibarra who I, th I think he nailed this one pretty well. Um and in fact, it was uh, Father Thomas Guarino also in his work on um, Vatican II and, and reversals um, who points it out from Vincent of Lorenz. He points out this distinction there in the patristic era um, where even in the age of um, Vincent, he speaks about that which is believed always everywhere and by all. And yet he refers to a doctrine that he himself admits is not believed by always, you know, was it always everywhere and by all, literalistically, maintained. How can Vincent of Lorenz do that? Is he an idiot? No. Maybe he's using that term in a non-literalistic way and he's referring to a moral majority. Maybe something along those lines. Or you could just say, yeah, he's an idiot. Of course, Vincent of Lorenz was, wasn't an idiot at all, by any means. He, he recognizes this distinction. Well, if this distinction is there in Vincent of Lorenz, we're not doing anything innovative by using that same distinction in our language. It's the same language that came from Vincent, and yet Vincent himself recognizes this distinction and doesn't hyper-literalistically interpret it the way White does. Again, there's better arguments against Catholicism than this. And if you just read the sources a little bit better, you won't make arguments like this. Let's continue. End quote. 
Direct quotation. No newly conceived opinion set forth, but the venerable and constant belief of every age. Right. And here he goes with the literalistic interpretation. But yes, I'll, I'll defend in, in every age. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you see the attestation to papal infallibility and supremacy in the first millennium, it's hard to say otherwise. And there's a lot of sources that I know Dr. White doesn't know about. I know he doesn't know about. Because in the areas that he needed to engage the most, they're nowhere on his radar. Nowhere on his radar. They weren't on his radar 30 years ago, and they're not now. And it's not arrogance to say that. It's arrogance to think that you've studied everything, and you already know everything, and you've already accounted for everything, and you don't have to listen to anybody else younger than you. That's arrogance. Now, for anyone familiar with uh, John Henry Cardinal Newman, and what he wrote about the infallibility of the Pope before Vatican I and what he did afterwards. Um, Why does he continue to bring this up? I, I really, I really honestly wonder why. Let, let's just say that for the moment, even though we, we don't have to accept this position about Newman, let's just say that Newman maintained a heretical perspective about the papacy, a conciliarist perspective, which he didn't. But let's just say he maintained a heretical perspective about papal infallibility um, and also popes in relation to councils prior to the definitions of Vatican I and Pastor Eternus. Let's just pretend for them, right? And let's just say he does a 180 after that definition. What does that mean? Nothing. Nothing. At worst, it would just mean that you have a really smart man that came to some wrong conclusions, and after he sees the definitive judgment of the church, he submits to it because he already trusts that that magisterium has that authority from Christ. Yes, it all hinges on whether or not the magisterium actually does have the authority from Christ, but if in fact it does, which he's already accepted as a Catholic, then of course he would acquiesce to the definitive judgment of the church. But just because he objected to it prior to that, does that necessarily mean something? No. No, not necessarily. It doesn't necessarily mean that the definition is wrong. It just means you have a smart man that didn't necessarily account for everything that's out there. And that's evident in the fact that there's quite a few things that Vatican I did not engage in instances of papal infallibility. I mean, it hints at it, but they didn't even engage everything, let alone Newman individually. Ugh. You know that this was a massive issue. And to be an honest historian. <sighs> yeah, it was, it was a massive issue for some... Um, prior to the definition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what else was a massive issue? The consubstantial nature of the Holy Spirit. I mean, prior to Constantinople I, for a lot of people that was up for grabs. It shouldn't have been because scripture in my estimation was clear enough on it but for some people who are still unclear of it yes you need a definitive judgment of the church at that point um when the controversy gets large enough which it did the existence of a, a large group of people that are wrong about a issue that hasn't even been dogmatically defined yet doesn't mean anything we've been dealing with that from day one how does this somehow take away from the definition of the church it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it would if you have this hyper-literalistic understanding of those phrases in Pastor Eternus like Dr. White does. Yeah, if I were to accept that hyper-literalistic hyper understanding, sure, I could, I could never say that about anything, though. I, I could then never say that it was known in every age by always and by all everywhere. I couldn't say that about anything. I, can, I couldn't even say that about the deity of the Holy Spirit or Jesus or what have you is to recognize how fictitious this claim is on the part of the Roman magisterium but here's the problem if you therefore are going to be faithful to the Roman magisterium then you have to do history 
in light of the dogmatic claims of Rome, because Rome is not Rome is not saying no, no. Although I will concede something to Dr. White. When there's a definitive judgment, you do have to offer an, an irrevocable assent. If it's dogmatic, it's the assent of faith. If it's Catholic doctrine, the definitive Catholic doctrine, it's to be held definitively, the assent. So I, I grant that, yes, you, you do have an irrevocable assent in either one of those cases, primary objects or secondary objects. I grant that. What doesn't logically follow is that I now have to reinvent history and reinterpret history. No. No. Although there's more evidence than you would think, and that Dr. White is aware, because I've listened to his material at length, there's more attestation for the Immaculate Conception than you would think, or Dr. White would have you think. It's scarce compared to attestation for the deity of the Holy Spirit, or I'm sorry, for the deity of Christ. Scarce. Scarce compared to that. Well, I mean, you could say the same thing of the Holy Spirit, but let's use a stronger example. Um much less historical evidence for that proposition, right? Um, that actually doesn't pose a problem, though. Um, for re Well, I, I suppose we could do a whole show on it, um, but I'll, I'll just briefly mention that some things could be, um, some as far as material that goes back to divine apostolic revelation, um, yes, it most certainly could be something that hasn't been unpacked in every age, but the, the substance of it is there. So the substance of original sin is, is there, although it's definitely articulated uh, much more clearly as the years progress. But the substance of original sin goes back to the, the, the Old Testament, um, and is especially there in the New Testament. Um, and of course, that's, that's a huge part for the issue of the Immaculate Conception. Um, and then also the, the substance of the stuff that would necessitate the position of the Immaculate Conception. The material there is, is there. It's it's there from the first century. Um, putting it together, forming it, yeah, sure, that is definitely something that I would say does develop, most certainly. The material doesn't, but the form added to the material does, the, the conclusions to it. Um, although there is more attestation to the Immaculate Conception than you might think. Um, but again, like I said, let's just say there's very little attestation. Um, does that mean that you have to now reinterpret history? No, no, you could, you could concede that because you would, you would, you would be able to recognize the distinction between, um, explicit attestation versus just material attestation. The material is there, but they, they didn't necessarily connect all the dots at every point. And the same actually applies to this language of always and everywhere. This language of always and everywhere is talking especially about the material has always been there. The material has always been there. Has it been put together and packaged um, clearly in every age? Not necessarily. That's also why I can say the Orthodox materially testify to the papal claims. They just don't develop them. They just don't form them in the way that we have in the second millennium. Um, although you you do find seeds of it also in the first millennium. Um, okay, well, we're getting way off topic. Let's uh, let's move forward. Let me maybe see if I can fast forward this a little bit, um, make it go a little faster here. Let's try this. Let me know if this is too fast for you. And you must interpret this Bible verse this way. We... We would think by now there would be an entire infallible commentary on the New Testament. They've had plenty of time to do it, uh, but there isn't. And in See, I've, I've also answered this one multiple times in my engagements with Dr. White's material. He just doesn't, he doesn't listen. And he's not obligated to listen to me. That, that's fine. He's, there's no obligation to personally listen to me. Although there is if you're going to critique me like he's doing right now. If you're going to critique me by name, which he did, you, you're obligated to watch my material either while you're doing the critique or before. At some point, you have to listen to what I say and then offer commentary, just like I'm listening to you first and then offering commentary. You're obligated to listen at some point in some kind of way, which he hasn't done. <sighs> in fact, you'll you'll hear Roman Catholic politicians today say, well, there's, there's been seven verses that have been infallibly interpreted. Another say none have been None of them infallibly interpreted. 
I, I don't know how you, any Catholic could maintain that no verse has been infallibly interpreted if they've ever read the Council of Trent. Um, although I know why they're saying that, because they're saying, well, it's not in the definition. That's what they're trying to explain to Dr. White. And yes, it's not in the definition, but was it Franzen? Was it Franzlin um, who, who mentions it? Um, I know Sullivan also notes it. Anything in the chapters that corresponds to the dogmas, uh, I'm sorry, the canons that are defined is considered definitive. So that would then include certain interpretations. So like at Trent where you have original sin being defined, was it Romans 5.12 that it appeals to? I think it's Romans 5.12. That would be a definitive interpretation of Romans 5.12. And that's not my novel in, in interpretation or anything like that. That's generally conceded by anybody who's educated about the magisterium. The problem is Dr. White is listening to people who are well-meaning, but they may not have studied the magisterium in depth. Okay, that's fine. Not everybody is, is going to have the same expertise. It's perfectly fine. But what I'm saying is go to the people who are experts in that area. I mean, he, he would find it really, 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 really offensive if I went to Leighton Flowers to determine what is Calvinism, right? He, he would find that if I just completely ignored R.C. Sproul, Dr. White, et al., and just ignored all those guys and just go to Leighton Flowers. <laughs> Dr. Flowers, tell me what Calvinism is. You know, he would be just like, what are you doing? Go, go to the experts, on Calvinism, and that would be much better than going to somebody who's not really qualified to speak on it, right? I mean, I'm not necessarily saying Leighton Flowers isn't, but I'm, I I know that White would think that necessarily that um, Leighton Flowers isn't. So, <laughs> Dr. Flowers, if you're watching, I'm not making any judgments on you. I'm talking about how uh, Dr. White would perceive you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming on the show, by the way, a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, I digress. Go to people who are experts in the magisterium. Dr. John Joy would be a great person, great person uh, that Dr. Um, White could interact with on the magisterium. Dr. John Joy, expert on the magisterium. Um, go to figures like that and, and engage them. Don't just go to people who that's not their area of expertise, but they offer to comment on it and you just took it as if it's kosher. Solidly interpreted. They, a true interpretation has been given a small number of verses, and you have to accept that true interpretation. But that may not be the only interpretation, and it's 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 a mess. But this is in the realm of history. And by the way, do we need an infallible interpretation of every verse of Scripture? No, as I've noted before, and as I noted in the debate that he tried to review, my debate with Chris Day that he tried to review that he did a very poor job at, as I demonstrated in the follow up video. Um, Although he only watched my opening statement, to my knowledge, I don't think he watched anything else. So I don't, I don't think he caught this part. Um, actually, you you really don't need a definitive judgment interpreting the vast majority of of scriptures. There there are some instances where it would be helpful, such as the Council of Trent on um, Romans five, right? That's most certainly helpful. Um, I would say Nicaea offers a definitive judgment on how to interpret Proverbs 8, right? Um, in light of its definition on, of, of, of Nicaea. Um, but do you, did you really need that, right? Did you, did you really need Nicaea to tell you that? No, not necessarily, not necessarily, but sometimes controversies do rise to the level where the majority of people might need that. Um, but... You actually don't need that in the vast majority of, of of scriptures in the Old or New Testament anyway, because there are a lot of things that are explicit in scripture that you don't need a definition for. As I've said before, noted before, uh, the Holy Family had a flight to Egypt, right? Um, they fled to Egypt. Do I need a definitive definition on that? No. No, it's clear they fled to Egypt. Um, Jesus is the Messiah. Do I need a definitive definition on a verse that testifies to Jesus being the Messiah to know that Jesus is the Messiah according to the New Testament? No, no. It's so abundantly clear that to this day, 
We have zero definitions on Jesus being the Messiah. You know why? Because it's not something that is disputed because it's outrageously and abundantly clear in the New Testament. Therefore, you don't have any definitions on Jesus being the Messiah. You don't need one. You just don't need one. You don't need one for the vast majority of scriptures. The only time you need a magisterial intervention, whether it's on scripture or just a matter of doctrine, period, just generally considered, is when it, whenever there is a controversy that rises to the point um, that you can't get an explicit um, settlement through an appeal to scripture. Maybe you should be able to, but uh, if there's deficiencies in, in, in people, yeah, it might be helpful to offer a definitive magisterial intervention. Everything is materially there in, in, in Scripture, so in that sense, you wouldn't need it. But sometimes adding form to that matter, you don't, you'll need a magisterial intervention. So again, this is, this is a straw man. This is a straw man that has been accounted for, and Dr. White would know that if he actually listened to other people. Um. We don't need that. Even after 2,000 years, we don't need the Pope to go out or an ecumenical council to go out and say, this verse has to be interpreted this way. This verse has to be interpreted this way. And then do that for literally all the books of the Bible and every verse in there. You don't need that. Moreover, that's also a misunderstanding of the definitive nature of the magisterium. Let's put that issue to the side, though, that it assumes a faulty understanding of the definitive nature to the magisterium. I'm, I'm tabling that issue without going into an hour excursus on that to just note that this is absurd because we can recognize the majority of propositions that we would agree to or that we would just make can be clearly testified to in Scripture. And you don't need, you don't need an interpretation for it. And some of these claims that Rome has made dogmatically, they are historical claims. And central to the, and, and I think it's because the papacy is self-conscious of its own ahistoricity. Um, as more and more the documents that were vital, definitionally vital to the establishment of the papacy have been shown to have been forgeries. It, it's Yeah, we get this from some Orthodox online all the time, right? Yeah, no, nothing new there. This is still same old, old, you know, same old Dr. White from the 90s. Nothing has changed. Take all of the instances that you would claim are forgeries. Take every single one, which, which, which is curious because the forgery claim actually helps the case of the papacy in some odd ways. Um, and that is, why would something like this be forged if it was completely novel? Nobody would have accepted it. They would have known it was immediately novel. It was just completely, it was just forged in some cases to make it more easy to substantiate. Um, but you might say, okay, well, why would you still need to, you know, forge this or that, even if it's well intentioned? Why would you need to do that if there is this attestation? <laughs> A lot of ways that we can go with it. But let's ask the question is there attestation prior to these instances that he wants to speak about when it comes to forgeries? Is there attestation? Forgeries that were, by the way, accepted by a lot of people in the East. Interesting, right? Interesting that the East would accept some of these forgeries, hmm. especially the ones about the papacy. That's odd. You would think that they would reject them. No. Again, putting aside the issue of forgeries, this is one of the weakest arguments I've heard. This is why I'm very, very disappointed in anyone that I hear that's educated like Dr. White make these claims. When I say educated, I don't mean educated in this area. I mean educated in other areas. He's incredibly educated in other areas. This is clearly not his area. You have strong attestation to the papal claims in the first millennium well before any of these instances of forgeries. Although I know some of these um, forgeries, you, you, you might argue, go back to you know, maybe the mid you know, first millennium or something like that. That's fine. You, you still even have um, attestation to it prior to that. Um, what do we do about that? Right. So what, what I'm saying is take all the forgeries, throw them away. Right. 
can the papal claims be substantiated with the legitimate documents that are extant? Yes. And that's all I'm considering. I'm not even considering any kind of forgeries. I'm just considering the issue, the, the, the content that is extant, that is not a forgery. That's all I'm considering in the first millennium. Um, it's there and he needs to account for it. And I, I hope he, he reads Eric Ibarra's book when it comes out, because he does a really good job at, at taking a lot of that information and putting it in one place, because that information is available, but it's just dispersed all over, right? I mean, just hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of books out there that are on the papacy. There's just all kinds of data out there. I think what Eric does, I know his book is not out yet, but it'll be out soon. What his book does is it takes a lot of that and puts it in a convenient place for you. Um, which I think Dr. White would profit from if he were to read it. Almost like the papacy is like, well, you need to say, we've, this is what we've always believed. And some of you may not remember back when John Paul II died, his pontificate had been a very long pontificate. And so for a week or more, all the Roman Catholic apologists were getting their 15 seconds of fame on Fox News, basically, uh, talking about how wonderful John Paul was. And all of them said the same thing, the faith of the church for 2,000 years. No, I can see myself back here. <laughs> right now, the way Rich has things, it looks like I'm. Yeah, look, this is a legitimate criticism of my fellow apologists. I, I, you know what? Every time I hear a Catholic say that, I roll my eyes. Every time. I mean, not not that I believe that the the faith faith has changed in two thousand years substantially or anything like that, but notice I use the term substantially. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't stand when Catholics say that it's the same faith for 2000. Yeah, I get what you're saying. You know, I totally get what you're saying because you're, you're talking about substantially and, you, you know, the matter is there and everything. I get what you're saying, but that's not how most people are going to interpret you. So please stop saying that because it's just going to create more confusion than good. And, and people are going to hear that claim and then they're going to go, and read something in Augustine and think, oh, wait, I thought this was always the same. And here Augustine is highly venerated by the Catholic Church and he teaches this and the church rejects that position. And, and they get confused and they get thrown off course because we've just kind of used an imprudent way of putting things. Um, so I. I have to just roll my eyes anytime a fellow apologist says that. I've been guilty of it in the past before, right? I've I've been guilty of that myself. We we've all been guilty of it, but let's try to learn from some of those mistakes. So I look, I, I grant this one to Dr. White. Okay, conceded. Let's move on. Never seen the sun, um, and I live in Phoenix. I, I I am not even close to as white and washed out as Rich currently. I don't know what he's trying to. I don't know if he's trying to get get sympathy for me. Look at the poor old man. We never let him out. Uh, he, he's, he's pale and, and, and dying. Yeah. I didn't notice he does. He does look pretty pale there. Huh? The beard is looking really good though. I, I'm digging the beard. I, Dr. White, if, if I could just get my beard like you, I mean, I'll, I would have reached my goal. Well, now it's like, now, now it looks like me trying to read a book up close because <laughs> you just lost the, you just lost the focus. You can't see if you lost the focus there. Cause, cause I can, I can, well, you just messed the whole thing up. Good. Didn't you? <laughs> you got do, it not, back. do not, do not, do not. Throw a curveball at, at Rich. He, look, he hasn't been in here for... He must have lights on top of the cameras or a monitor in front of him to know which camera he shifted to. You know, a month and two weeks or so, and I just see him sitting back there looking at all the buttons and stuff like that going, what is this? It's just like, it's, what, what does it do? Uh, okay, yeah. So what were we talking about? Moses was in the bulrushes, and um, yeah, so the point is uh, that... Um, I did lose where I was, but Sadis Cognitum. The, the point is that Rome tells you what you're supposed to find in history. Oh, that's right. I was talking about when, when John Paul II died. I looked back at you to see if you remember what it was like when John Paul II died. And every Catholic apologist I'd ever debated or had, had interactions with, they're all on Fox News talking about how the 2,000-year-old church, continuity, sameness, this had been the argument. Yeah, the, it was, again, there was this stuff that actually pushed me a little bit towards orthodoxy, you know, because we do sometimes oversell the Catholic claims in the Catholic case. We, we, we oversell it. And 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 we we need to mitigate that a little bit. <laughs> let's let's curve our language a little bit. Uh, I get what you're saying. What you're saying is is true, but it's going to be understood by people like White and and new converts to Catholicism in a very different way. So that that's a very imprudent way of putting it. I I don't like to say, oh, two thousand years has all been the same. No, it hasn't. 
Um, the the deposit of faith has substantially been preserved in every single age. Most certainly, most certainly, the application of that deposit of faith has not been the same for two thousand years. Nope. What about non-definitive teachings that are not necessarily a matter of deposit of faith, but might just somehow relate to it? They've definitely been expressed differently. Definitely expressed differently. Even that propositions that are definitive have been expressed differently. The proposition, the substance is, 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 is the same. It's still true. Um, but it, it definitely, in some cases, has been expressed differently. Uh, which is why the magisterium has, has spoken about this, right? It, it's, it's engaged those points. Argument for the papacy for years when I was debating Catholic answers and doing things like that. Um, I can tell that things have changed. I know that you all know that Francis is Francis, and he's very different. I, I get it. Um, and I think all of you, when you, when the lights are turned off and you lay your head down to sleep each night, I think you know in your heart, <laughs> uh, that things have changed. Point is this. <laughs> uh, what what are you say thing when you say things have changed uh, look i get where you're coming from but again let's let's be a little bit more um realistic in our assessment here <laughs> i get the rhetoric right um the the content of of his magisterium has has been the same as, as far as the doctrinal propositions yeah, prudential disciplinary decisions, no doubt. Applications of certain doctrines prudentially, yeah, yeah, sure. And some of those I, I criticize, right? Um, the application of the doctrine of the death penalty, for example. The doctrine itself has not changed. Uh, although there has been a more awareness of human dignity, the doctrine substantially has, has been the same. But an application of it in our current age, that prudential decision and judgment... Um, that that discipline most certainly has changed. And that's not necessarily problematic. I mean, that, that that's fine. Um, sometimes that needs to happen in history due to very different circumstances in history. Uh, certain circumstances may arise that that becomes necessary. But um, has has the actual content? changed no so let's let's maybe be a little bit more mitigated in the way that we we articulate this portion i don't know how you all fit together what status cognition says with um the development hypothesis i, I really mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. see but that that's what i offer right not just myself but others we offer presentations on how to do just that and i would say i would then ask well where are we getting it wrong? And you would have to actually listen to what we're saying to know where we get it wrong. You'd actually have to listen to us first. Maybe you should do it. I really don't. It doesn't make any sense. I, I highly recommend to everybody, how in the world did I just get a bunch of black stuff on my hands from, from up here? I'm just, um, hmm. we're having lots of fun today. It is always live. Um, how you important? I know how that goes. Doing things live, yep. Yeah, I'm not really sure how that would work. But anyway, um, I don't know how you all put it together because as George Salmon documented, and I highly recommend anyone track down infallibility of the church by George, oh, but that was written so long ago. If it, if it hasn't been since 2015, I mean, who, nobody knew what they were talking about before 2015. Okay, anyway. Uh, he just argues very cogently that the development hypothesis as posited by John Henry Cardinal Newman and utilized by Roman Catholic apologists constantly uh, in the modern period is a fundamental abandonment of the historical field of battle. And it is. It's no, no, I don't, I don't concede that. I don't concede that. Um, even in the cases of the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception, I don't, I don't concede that it's just an abandonment of historical, uh, the historical field. Moreover, why continue to harp on Henry, John Henry Newman in this stereotype that it's because of him that Catholicism, you know, he saved the day. Otherwise, there's just no way to account for our positions. First of all, you'll note White is generally thinking of. Latin Rite Catholicism is not thinking more broadly of Eastern Catholicism as well. So the Catholic Church as a whole, he's he's kind of he tends to think of just the largest group, and that is going to be um, the Latin Rite. So that that's already a problem. But um, what Newman was proposing is substantially there in in Vincent of Lorenz. So it'd be more fitting to give a critique of Vincent of Lorenz than 
it would be of John Henry Newman. Literally saying, yeah, we're not going to find in the early, we're not going to find. And I say, yeah, yeah, the, the papacy is still developing. It's, it's the acorn into the tree. You'd expect that there, would, there wouldn't be a recognition of these things and so on and so forth. Yeah, I, I can see the development. What, what do we mean by development, though? Is, is the material there? Yes. Um, are there even people that have recognized that materially and put form to it and expressed it by the time of the Council of Nicaea for the papacy? Yes. Yes. And so you've got that approach, but it does seem to me that there are others that, that don't want to go the Newman direction until they're pushed into a corner. Um, some of you saw the really funny video last year, uh, just slap some Newman on it, uh, which was where they... they <laughs> I saw that video. I died laughing, even though I think it's 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 ridiculous as far as a complete caricature. Sorry, let me open my beer here. It's been sitting over here forever. My Corona. I uh, I don't know if Doctor White is. Well, he's he's not going to watch this video anyway, so I guess it doesn't matter what Doctor White thinks about beer. But um, uh, there there might be some Baptists that are watching me that will that will anathematize me. Trust me, I I, I won't get drunk from when beer. Um, but, 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 but I, I actually don't, I don't know where, where does Dr. White weigh in on that one on, on the use of alcohol, as long as it's not unto, you know, the impairment of one's faculties or something like where, where, where does he fall on that one? I don't know. The guy, you know, where the guy had that, that stuff, you can slap on something and it seals the flex seal. Is that what it's called? The flex seal thing. And, and they changed it to slap some Newman on it. And, and that's how you fix any Roman Catholic uh, argument is you just flex, slap, slap some Newman on it. Uh, obviously to me. If you accept Newman's development hypothesis, you don't even have to worry about arguing about this stuff. You can look at the Sixth Canon Council of Nicaea, and you can look at it in its context. You can recognize that it's coming out of a council um, that was not under the, the single auspices of the Bishop of Rome. What does that have to do with invalidating Vatican I, as I showed in, in the video? Again, more proof he didn't watch it. He did not watch it. He doesn't even know what our claims are. He thinks he knows, but he, he's he's most certainly mistaken. Hmm. Again, Canon 6 is referring to a limited jurisdiction for a patriarchal or super metropolitical territory and jurisdiction of the Pope. It has nothing to do with his exercise as universal pastor. It's just, were they aware of that distinction? Yeah. Yes, they were. Yes, they were. Pope Stephen sure was, and I know he knows that one. Pope Stephen sure was. Uh, Pope Julius sure was. Athanasius sure was. Need we go on? You can recognize that um, the people at the council did not dogmatically believe the vast majority of things you dogmatically believe about Mary and papacy and purgatory and canon of scripture and just, just all sorts of stuff like that. And just go... I would challenge a great deal of that, but let's just let's just pretend for a moment that that's that that's accurate, right? Is that a problem for Catholicism? Let, let's say in the fourth century, right? Let's just say in the fourth century that the majority of people would not have expressed the Immaculate Conception. Let's put it that way. Can we speak about it being known in every age? You can if you mean by the material that necessitates the Immaculate Conception being there, yes, and they just simply didn't put two and two together. Um, you could in that sense. Is that what we meant whenever we spoke about, you know, this being known in every age? Actually, yes. Yeah. Um. So does this actually cause a problem for Catholicism that would invalidate our claims? No, because we're not saying that it has to be explicitly formed and well thought out. So in that sense, we can talk about development, right? Taking the material and, 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 and forming it. Yeah, we can talk about that in, in some cases, not in, in, in some of the cases that he thinks of, but I'd actually be willing to say that's applicable in, in certain cases. Yeah, the acorn is still developing. All's well. It's cool. No problem. Uh, it's only the people who want to go, no. 
Sadas Cognitum says, this is no newly conceived opinion, but the venerable and constant belief of every age. You can't put this in Newman. Right. So again, venerable and constant belief. What, what does he mean there? Is he talking about, again, something just well expressed as far as the form of it or the material being believed? Um, somebody says, will this be Michael's longest video? No. My longest video was three hour, three hours and 45 minutes. I think it actually was related to something with James White. <laughs> you know why my videos with James White are so long? Although my videos tend to be long anyway, because uh, there generally is a lot of distinctions that need to be made. But you know why? Because he presents so much material that requires a great deal of qualification. He's just one of those people that you, you you just can't review him very quickly. You might be able to do it easily, but not quickly. And together, it's just not possible. Um, I mean, you can pretend that you're doing it. Look, I'm, I'm going to throw this one out, even though I don't think that we have to pull this card. Because <laughs> I mentioned this earlier, we don't have to pull the card. You know that language in Satis, Satis Cognitum is not definitive, right? Let's just Let's just assume White's interpretation of that language for a second. Let's just assume it, which I don't concede. The fact that it isn't definitive, and I can substantiate that because there are objective indicators to know when, whenever a definitive proposition is being expressed, especially in this age. Um, is that definitive? No. Therefore, does that somehow invalidate our claims? No, because when we're talking about indefectibility in the magisterium, we're talking about, again, either definitive teachings or overall, you know, the majority of non-definitive teachings being reasserted over and over and over throughout the ages. Uh, that would also be protected by infallibility or indefectibility, I should say. Um, so really, this, this doesn't even invalidate our claims. And, and, and so I just kind of really have to wonder, why is he bringing this up? I suppose if you want to, but you know, it's it's pounding squares into round circles. You know, it's just it ain't gonna go in. It doesn't work. Well, it, it does work for the reasons why I explained. But again, even if it didn't, at, at worst you would just have a, a non-definitive error here, and that doesn't invalidate our claims to indefectibility in the teaching office, because it, it, it's we're not saying every non-definitive individual proposition is is free from all error. Otherwise, it wouldn't be non-definitive. So this is what I was talking about, was that when you look at Council of Nicaea, and you do not have a dogmatic authority <clears throat> telling you what you need to find. So you see, the Roman Catholic apologist, looking at the fourth century, has already been told, this is the constant belief of every age. Therefore, that's the, the lens through which you look, and therefore... Hmm. Let me play an atheist. It says, all Judea went out to see John the Baptist... Do you really believe that, Dr. White? Oh, your New Testament is ridiculous. And how could you actually believe that? You really think everyone in Judea walked out there? How did they all fit in the area surrounding John the Baptist? I mean, seriously? When you get to this level of argumentation, I have to seriously question intentions. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. Although it's very hard to do whenever he's reviewing me having not watched my content. But let's just turn this around and use this exact same kind of skepticism towards the New Testament. And how would that work out for Dr. White? It wouldn't work out very well. But he's the one who always preaches about being consistent, right? Be consistent. Okay, well, are you being consistent, Dr. White? I mean, you hate when Muslims use New Testament critical scholars to argue against the New Testament, but then wouldn't use that against the, those same methods against the Quran, and you point that out. Okay, do the same thing to yourself. Take the same kind of criticism that you're using here for the magisterium and apply it to your own understanding of the New Testament. You look at everything through that lens. You, you have to do that to be uh, dogmatically faithful your own church and that's why i say you don't have to you can recognize that there are instances in history that would be contrary to a definition um there are most certainly instances in the first millennium that uh certain figures denied the papal claims like cyprian i think rejected 
um, later on, I, I do think that he rejected Catholic ecclesiology, um, at, at least at the universal level. And the problem with Cyprian is nobody holds his ecclesiology, Catholics, Protestants, or Orthodox. Like nobody holds his ecclesiology. Uh, <laughs> so nobody can actually use Cyprian, right? <laughs> Cyprian's out of bounds for everybody. <laughs> but yeah, there, there are particular instances in history that I could say are, are contrary to um, a definition. No doubt. There, there are people who, who deny the orthodoxy of the homoousias, right? I mean, there's all kinds of instances that we, we could point out to. It doesn't mean we have to be unfair with history. Hey to you, from a religious dogmatic position, Roman Catholic apologists cannot do church history because their church history has already been defined for them by the dogmatic statements of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I'm sorry. Frankly, this is coming from somebody who doesn't know enough about church history to really speak about it. And yes, I know. He's taught courses on history. But as I said, whenever you're trying to use an aureus against papal infallibility, when it's that very same council that puts forward papal infallibility, bad argument. And that shows me you don't know church history very well. It's not that, hey, you know, if you examine fairly each age of the church, you're going to find that this is the true belief. No, it's the exact opposite. This is the true belief, and therefore you need to find it in every age of the church. No, I, I don't I don't think it's, it's saying that, but okay. And that's how you can get these amazing explanations. So... I'm going longer on this than I want to, but um, when we look at the Council of Nicaea, given its context, we have nothing here about the supremacy of the teaching authority um, or jurisdictional authority of the Bishop of Rome. It was Well, I mean, that would, number one, assume that we're using his version of Canon 6 that doesn't have the language about a universal supremacy, because there, there are some versions of Canon 6 that do have that language. But, you know, using his, his version of Canon 6, as I pointed out, why are we restricting everything to the canons? Um, are, are we really going to say that unless it's actually articulated in, in the canon, they, they didn't maintain anything aside from that? Like, So because there's no canons about the deity of the Holy Spirit, just nobody maintained it? Yeah, I know some of them would have denied it, actually, which is why they punted on it and didn't address it. Uh, but does that mean nobody accepted it? No, some would have accepted it. Okay. Maybe you could even say a moral majority would have, maybe. Um, but a significant amount would have rejected it at that time. Um, so does that really mean anything here? No. I can go to surrounding figures. I could go to figures who were at Nicaea, Athanasius, for example. I, I can go to figures who were there surrounding the events of Nicaea, Nicaea that certainly put forward the papacy. He's arbitrary, arbitrarily limiting things to the canons. And I don't accept this canonist only or canon only position that you'll see some Orthodox online maintain. I don't accept that. I don't limit myself to canons alone. And, and, and they, they can't practically do that either because none of the canons teach the real presence and yet those Orthodox apologists would maintain the real presence. So nobody's a canon-only uh, theologian at the end of the day anyway. Um, so I, I don't accept this arbitrary limit, limiting of the parameters of the discussion. Um, just because they did not deal with the issue of papal jurisdiction universally considered, just because they didn't deal with that issue, doesn't mean that it was somehow rejected. Doesn't even mean that it was affirmed, right? We would we would have to go to supporting sources to really know what all was was maintained. It wasn't called because he said it should be called. It didn't originate from him. Uh An ecumenical council does not have to be called by the Pope in every age. In canon law today, it does, um, but not in every age. It could be called by an emperor. Um, it could be called by someone else. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be called by the Pope in every age. It's just canonically now we've regulated it to where it would be the, the Pope would call an ecumenical council. So this is a straw man. Uh, no one was going, well, we're going to we're gonna come up with a creed and then we'll submit it to the Bishop of Rome to see if it's okay. That comes along. Huh. Really? Okay. Well, it's just interesting given, you know, how, how much the creed in Rome... Um, played a prominent factor in the development of the creed. But yeah, I get what he's saying. But again, I don't limit 
the parameters of the, this discussion to those instances. Just because nobody went to the Bishop of Rome and said, hey, give us a creed, doesn't mean that that invalidates the papal claims. It just doesn't. I'm sorry. J just because Jesus um, is God and is clearly infallible proper, um, and just because somebody didn't give go up to him and say, Jesus, tell me how to build you know, some kind of vessel that would travel to other planets. And Jesus never gave him that information on how to access a wormhole because he didn't give him that information. He clearly is an omniscient or something. It, what? <laughs> Why are we limiting, you know, the parameters of this discussion to that one instance? I mean, does, does that lack of that one instance really invalidate the whole thing? So because nobody asked Jesus how to build a spaceship, to enter some black hole <laughs> because nobody asked him that well, clearly Jesus didn't know everything and nobody thought that Jesus knew everything because if they thought they he knew everything they would have gone and asked him how to build a spaceship come on a lot later um none of that's true the very fact that the council is called demonstrates that at this point in time uh even though the bishop of Rome has been making big claims for a long time starting with Victor uh certainly Oh, okay. Interesting. He's been making big claims. All right. Cyprian has to tell the Bishop of Rome to cool the jets and succeeds in doing that. And North Africa. He doesn't succeed. <laughs> Cyprian's position stood. Uh, I'm sorry, um, Stephen's position stood. Cyprian's um, position was rejected. Um, so he, he most certainly did not succeed. And bishops specifically repudiate the claims of Rome to have some kind of special authority over them. Um, despite wanting to have unity. I mean, it's always in the context of trying to maintain some kind of unity. Um, this is the context. Yeah, North, North African, some of the North African bishops were in, were in dissent on, on some of the papal claims. Um, just like a significant of bishops were in dissent of Chalcedon. So what? So what? And so we see the six canons. And in that context, it has a uh, plain... You mean the context where I've already substantiated that the papal claims were being made in that contemporary era mm -hmm. by even some of the figures that are at Nicaea. But again, my point was, he was just simply addressing him. He brought up Canon six as if that is an instance that disproves the universal claim that is made at Vatican one. And I just showed, no, it doesn't disprove it. What I said was, if you watch the video, Dr. White, which you're not going to watch this one anyway, so I don't know why I'm addressing you. For anybody who's watching this video, if you watch my other video where I responded to Dr. White, I note this. I note this. I note that <clears throat> you have, well, let me just not repeat everything that I said in the previous video. Let me just say, go back and watch, what was it, two, three days ago I did the video? Something like that. Just go back and watch that. It was a whole hour. Uh, no point in me just re reinventing the wheel here. Really non-controversial meaning. Uh, lots of try to make it look like this disproves Catholicism. This is simply a fair, honest analysis of a historical fact. Wait, what? Let's rewind that. Hold on. Because all I said was the case of Canon 6 neither proves nor denies universal jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff. It neither proves nor denies it. And he used it as if it disproves universal jurisdiction. And I showed that's not the case because it's referring to a patriarchal jurisdiction, not a universal jurisdiction. And those two are compatible because we maintain that distinction today, after Vatican I. So... Let, let me hear, listen to him again there. In regards to the nature of the Council of Nicaea, that is one of an entire massive cumulative case that demonstrates that the papacy is a modern innovation that developed over time. They always want to try to, it's, 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 it's just proving Catholicism. And, and look, the only people that are going to be impressed by that video are the people who are desperate to continue believing what well, they've already always believed. Well, I don't think I rewinded it enough. Let me... Go back here. Analysis of a historical fact in regards to the nature of the Council of Nicaea 
that is one of an entire massive cumulative case that demonstrates that the papacy is a modern innovation that developed over time. They always want to try to be, it's, it's, it's just proving Catholicism. And, and look, the only people that are going to be impressed. I, I, I don't understand him. Impressed by, despite wanting to have unity, I mean, it's always in the context of trying to maintain some kind of unity. Um, this is the context. And so we see the sixth canon. And in that context, it has a uh, plain, really non-controversial meaning. Uh, Lofton tried to make it look like, this disproves Catholicism. This. Lofton tried to make it like this disproves Catholicism? Okay, I think he's saying that I was saying that he was saying Canon 6 disproves Catholicism. Yeah. Otherwise, why would you bring it up in the Council of Vatican, in the context of Vatican I? Why would, why would you bring that up? Dr. White, the reason why you brought up Canon 6 and it's Canon, speaking about jurisdiction, in the context of Vatican I, Vatican I's language about jurisdiction, the only reason why you brought that up is because you think Canon 6 disqualifies Vatican I and invalidates it. Now, if you're trying to retrace or you're trying to backtrack that and say, oh, no, I'm just saying that they had no idea of the concept of a universal supremacy. But Dr. White, they're not, they're not commenting on it either way. They're neither affirming nor denying. They're just not commenting on it at all. It's absolutely irrelevant to the discussion. That's the point. This is simply a fair, honest analysis of a historical fact in regard to the nature of the Council of Nicaea. Uh, of course, Dr. White thinks that his analysis is fair and historical. Uh, little bias there. Forgive me if I'm not convinced. Dr. White, especially given that you didn't watch my video. It is one of an entire massive cumulative case that demonstrates that the papacy is a modern innovation that developed over time. They always want to try to, it's, 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 it's just proving Catholicism. And, and look, the only I'm not saying that it was that, but what I was saying, if you had watched the video that you're attempting to criticize, and that's a very unwise thing to do, to watch something that you haven't actually criticized something that you haven't watched. What I was doing is saying this particular instance doesn't comment on the issue of universal jurisdiction it, either way. So to bring it up is irrelevant. The only reason why you would bring it up is because you think it weighs against the claims made at Vatican I, either because you think that it's judging against it, or you're wanting to say, well, they're just not aware of it at all. The lack of them not mentioning it doesn't mean that they weren't aware of it. It just wasn't pertinent to that canon. They, what was the intention of the canon? It was to deal with Alexandria and its territory. It had nothing to do with the claim to universal jurisdiction, so it would be irrelevant to even bring it up. The only people that are going to be impressed by that video are the people who are desperate to continue believing what they've already always believed. Dr. White, with all due respect, you did not watch my video. So how can you say that? You did not watch my video. You did not listen to what I said. You did not account for anything I said. I could be wrong. I could completely be wrong. But you wouldn't know it. You know why you wouldn't know it? Because you didn't watch my video. So you're not in a position to make that determination. You might be right. Maybe I'm wrong. And maybe everybody who agrees with me are just desperate to believe the Catholic Church. Maybe that's true. But not because you would know it. Not because you watched my video to know it. Not because you're aware of who my audience is. So I think that this is what you were referring to earlier as, as arrogance. It seems like arrogance. To make judgments about a video about a person's position without actually even hearing what they had to say. And Dr. White, if you come back and say you watched my video, that's even worse. I'll think even less of your position then, because if you actually watched my video and you offer this as a response, I might not just respond to you anymore. <laughs> I think at that point, wow, if, if this is the response that you would offer after actually, actually having seen my video, I might be in dialogue, or whatever you call this, with the wrong person. I might be wasting my time. I'm only responding 
Well, number one, because I think other people would benefit. But also, I actually do think that Dr. White would benefit if he actually listened to this. I don't think he'll listen to it, though. But it won't help you if you come back and say, oh, I watched your video, Lofton. I watched it. First of all, I don't believe you watched it. You don't claim to have watched it. And you don't show any evidence of having watched it in this video so far. Um, it sounds to me like you heard somebody comment on it. And you also read my Twitter or Facebook uh, post. And that was it. You know, I get that. Um, it, was, it was just embarrassing. Really and he was like, it's just so embarrassing. Oh, okay, well, I think what you did was embarrassing. Um, and you watched my video, Dr. White? And you thought my video was embarrassing? That makes me think even less at this point. I, But I don't believe he watched my video. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. He shows absolutely no evidence. And things that he's saying in here, he wouldn't say if he actually heard my video. Um, so you're making judgments about my video saying it's embarrassing without actually having seen it. And if you, again, you have seen it and you believe it's it's embarrassing based on what you've seen. Yeah, I, I might be, I, I might have the wrong impression about you, Dr. White. I may have thought of you a little higher than I should have. But I can sit here and talk about it on a on a significantly more grounded historical basis than you possibly can. A grounded historical basis. A, a guy who has absolutely no awareness of Agatho's letter to the emperor at the Sixth Council and then tries to use Honorius as somehow invalidating the Catholic claims. Historical awareness. Let's be frank. You know, Dr. White, you, you don't have an historical awareness as much as you realize or may think that you have. You don't realize that you actually are lacking in some areas. That's not to say that I know everything about church history, but it is to say I recognize where you have your weaknesses. I recognize your deficiencies in some areas of, of your knowledge of church history. I recognize them because you wouldn't say some of the things that you're saying if you knew some additional data. You would just come at things from a different angle. Because you've already been told what to find. You're not, you're, you are not an unbiased person. You're not doing church history. You're doing Catholic dogma. Dr. White, um, the New Testament comments on the Old Testament. I know you affirm the New Testament. And it also comments on the Old Testament in the context of historical matters. Does that make you a biased and unfair person? Are you biased and unfair when you now examine the history of the Old Testament because of what the New Testament says? If you say yes, hey, well, you know what? At least you're consistent. I have a sneaky suspicion you wouldn't say yes to that. And if you afford yourself that luxury, and the luxury of that distinction, why can't you do that for us? Which defines your history. So when we read the sixth canon, it simply says that there are spheres of ultimate authority of these ma major patriarchates. Rome, Alexandria, uh, and you know, church history shows. Spheres of ultimate authority? It doesn't say that. It's not speaking of ultimate authority. Again, it's speaking of a patriarchal authority or a super metropolitan, uh, metropolitical authority. It's not speaking of ultimate or universal spheres. It's not what it's saying. I mean, the, the whole difference, for example, in ecclesiology at the highest levels between the West and the East. Think about it. I've used this illustration many times, but think about the map of the Mediterranean. Uh, I wish I had one I could draw up. But anyway, um, think of the map of the Mediterranean. Draw a line right down the middle. And mark the seas that claim to be apostolic. Mark the apostolic seas. Doesn't mean they necessarily were, but what, what's an apostolic sea? A bishopric that claims to have been founded by an apostle. They had special, they were given special authority, primarily in the second century. Sorry to say. Anyway, uh, to the West, there's one, Rome. To the East, there are many. Eventually, uh, you know, you've got Antioch and, uh, and Alexandria and, and those are ones mentioned, but eventually Byzantium gets into the game and so on and so forth. And what do you have in East Orthodoxy? You've got collegiality, ostensibly, of equals with one another. And it just has a rather obvious historical background to it, why it developed the way that it did. And so what you have in Nicaea is simply a recognition that we will continue these delimitations of the areas of authority of these major bishoprics. So there's nothing about differing levels of authority. There's nothing about bishops versus patriarch. But you have to read that canon in light of the context that did recognize those distinctions. And again, just because they don't comment on something that is irrelevant doesn't mean that there's a lack of awareness. Nicaea 1 never comments on the deity of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that everyone would have denied it. 
some would have. It doesn't mean everyone would have. You just have to look at the historical context. Um, wow. Th this is a really bad argument. Versus the Pope, the infallible vicar of Christ on earth with universal jurisdiction, nothing about any of that. These uh, bishops, patriarchs, are mentioned in equality with one another. In equality with one another. So in, in Canon 6, they're mentioned with equality with one another. Let's just concede that for the moment. Again, again, are you a canon only guy? Well, of course he isn't, right? As a Baptist, but do you think we're canon only people? No. Do you think that the only way to know what someone believed was by consulting a canon? No. No. You, you would accept as sources of knowledge historical sources outside of Canon 6, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So when you go to those sources outside of Canon 6 and they're making distinctions here and they're speaking about a universal authority, but then they can also make other distinctions about patriarchal authority. Then making even other distinctions about authority in a just one diocese. Well, that would show that they're aware of those distinctions, right? Mm -hmm. This is just a very poorly thought out argument. And that's the problem, of course. But at the time, problem. once you look at what the, what the council was doing, why it was called, what it does, it makes perfect sense. That's, that's the honest historical way of looking at it. That's the... Why it was called, what it was doing, invalidates the papal claims? Not any more than why a his... Why did we call Vatican II? Is it because we didn't believe we could go to the Pope for an infallible definition? Is that why we called Vatican II? Huh. Vatican II was in 1962. The definition on papal infallibility was in 1870. So we were aware of papal definitions, and yet we still call an ecumenical council. Why is that? Well, so what is he talking about if you're aware of the historical circumstance? The historical circumstances actually substantiate the Catholic claim, as I've showed in, in, the, in the previous video with Pope Julius and others in the contemporary era. Contemporary era. Um, Moreover, I mean, you have the distinction again with, with Leo. So how does considering the historical context of the calling of the Council of Nicaea and validate the, the Catholic claims to the magisterium? We're going to let history define what's going on here, way of looking at it. But the Roman Catholic can't go there. You can't allow that. that you, so, so what you do... Again, are you able to honestly assess the Old Testament in light of the New Testament's interpretation of the Old Testament? And again, if you say no, okay, at least you're being consistent. But if you say yes, I can still honestly assess the Old Testament and yet maintain what the New Testament says about the Old Testament. Okay. Again, if you afford yourself that luxury and distinction, why don't you give it to us? Are you really being fair? Do. And the, the, oh, it's so obvious. This is so simple. I can't believe anybody doesn't know this. Michael Lofton's response um, was, well, this is just talking about was was that my response necessarily hmm. i did take that response for the fact that it's speaking about patriarchal jurisdiction because protestants and orthodox scholars recognize that why is that why is it that protestant and orthodox scholars recognize that about canon six dr white because it is obvious. So yes, I stand by that. If you think that it's not obvious what the historical context of Canon 6 is and what type of jurisdiction they're referring to, I'm sorry that that, that seems brash to you. I stand by that. Absolutely. Absolutely. About a certain kind of authority that the Patriarch of Rome has. So the Bishop of Rome has, has powers of Bishop in Rome and then powers of Patriarch over this area, but then he has the universal jurisdiction of Belgium. Whereas uh, the, the Bishop of Alexandria, he has Bishop powers in Alexandria and, and Patriarch powers over Egypt, but he is not the universal head of the church. And everybody knows that's what they meant. No, that is called an... They, they didn't... 
again, you, you have to read them in their historical context. Are they aware of a universal jurisdiction for the Bishop of Rome? Yes. So I would actually be accurate in, in saying that they are aware of that distinction. But even if they're not, let's just say they weren't aware of a distinction between universal and patriarchal, they're still only commenting on the patriarchal level. They're not commenting on anything above that or below that. It's still irrelevant. Anachronism, that's called abusing history, and that's called being a Roman Catholic apologist, not a historian. No, it's just called you being ignorant of church history, Dr. White. So this almost, I mean, he was talking about how laughable it was to bring it up. It was very laughable. I stand by that, Dr. White. You should be embarrassed to bring that up. You should not bring that up. I, I honestly think that what this did is it lowered your credibility. Because again, when Catholics, Orthodox, and Protestant scholars recognize this distinction and recognize that, hey, this has, isn't even anachronistic, and that this really doesn't touch on the issue of universal jurisdiction one way or another, I'll stand by that. I'll stand by that. 100%. And I think going, being a sophist, being a historical sophist, and going, well, it's just talking about uh, the, the authority of patriarchs. We can throw around names. Um, I'm not going to, but I, I could do that too. I could play that game as well. But I'll, I'll instead let the evidence speak for itself. And, and therefore, it's not even addressing the ultimate jurisdictional authority of the Pope. Okay, and um, proved that from the documents of the Council of Nicaea, the existence of the Council? Why limit it to the documents of the Council of Nicaea? Why, why can't I speak about documents in that contemporary time outside of Nicaea and some of the figures that were present at Nicaea? Why did you automatically limit me to a Nicaea alone position? I, I don't accept the parameters of this discussion. I just, I reject that. This is, this is a straw man. So Nicaea, anything like that? You can't. You're just assuming it. Because you've been told to assume. I'm not assuming it because I've been told anything. I'm talking about actual material that I've studied myself and the primary sources, not secondary sources. I'm sorry. There's no reason for anyone to take you seriously when you do history. You're... <laughs> Dr. White, again, I, I'll, instead of going that level with you, I'll let the viewers determine who should be taken seriously here. Documents tell you what to find. And when you find them, oh, golly, Bob, there it is. How impressive is that? It's not. It's not impressive at all. Uh, there was also some discussion that, again, missed the point. <laughs> uh, happens a lot. But I mentioned in passing that who was the one, the one person who stood for the deity of Christ, for the Council of Nicaea, during what's called the Aryan Ascendancy. I didn't go into this into history of this. Uh, I wrote an article years ago that really got an interesting, this is before social media, uh, but it got quite the interesting response out of Catholic Answers uh, about Athanasius and the Council of Nicaea. And uh, I, I discussed in there the reality of the fact that it, that it wasn't the Bishop of Rome that stood firm and led the charge in defense of Nicaea. N no one can make that argument. Oh, yeah, he, he made the claim about Liberius. Mm -hmm. No one can make that argument. Now, they, they say, well, there's, there's a dispute about whether Liberius uh, uh, signed the Arianized Sermium Creed. And, and we're not really sure whether it was really Arianized. Oh, please, guys, seriously, you, you have a... You have a creed being promulgated after Nicaea. Show us the actual creed that he signed. Show, show it to, read it to us. Read it to us. Please do that. Specifically seeking to get rid of Nicaea's authority uh, that refuses to use that language. And it's not Arianized while the Arians are in control. Really? I was, I was like, oh, guys, stop embarrassing yourselves. You, this, is, this is really bad. You got to stop. But I also noted, even if it was was under duress, so it really would be irrelevant to his magisterium. That was the ultimate point. But no, I still don't concede that. Read the actual creed to us. He can't do it. There's a reason why he can't do it. Uh, just, just, just stop. Um, but, but, but even if he did, he was, he was under pressure. I know that. Duh. Duh. But Athanasius was under pressure too, and he didn't give in. Uh, Athanasius wasn't under the same kind of pressure, but okay, let's just equivocate things. Okay. But Athanasius also, uh, we're not saying that Athanasius somehow is infallible in his magisterium and that if he were to give in, that would invalidate some kind of claim to infallibility. Again, what we're saying about the Pope is, yes, he has an infallible capacity in his magisterium. You're bringing up Liberius as if that somehow invalidates it. And I'm showing that, no, it doesn't because he's under duress. Pointing to the fact that Athanasius 
you know, under somehow a different kind of duress, didn't give in, is irrelevant. That's irrelevant to the point. That's the point. That's the, that was the whole point. And since you missed that point, I understand what you're doing. When you're, when you're refuting points that wasn't what I was making, that makes you sound better to the, again, you're trying to keep your audience, you're trying to give them. Dr. White, I honestly want to know, did you watch my video? Or did you just go based on what somebody else told you about my video? Reasons to believe, uh, because they heard a lot of stuff that, um, that you would rather deal with one at a time. Just once at a time. It's been a long time since we discussed this type of stuff, but, but keep this in mind. When talking about something like the papacy, uh, the facts do not come one fact at a time. It's a cumulative case. So theoretically, if you're ever caught in an avalanche, theoretically, you can dodge every rock. Okay. I actually think the cumulative case of the evidence is, is in favor of Catholicism. That's why I left communion with the Orthodox and, and came into communion with the Catholics. So I really believe that. So I actually think the, the cumulative case is much more significant than this. I mean, you know, if you see that rock coming and you can plot its trajectory, you can dodge every rock in an avalanche. There's only one problem. Avalanches do not come one rock at a time. They all come at once. It's a cumulative issue. And that's why you can't dodge it. You might dodge the first one, the second one's going to take you out. You might dodge well, I have to address one argument at a time because you're bringing up one argument at a time. But again, an accumulative case, I actually think is in favor of the Catholic claims. I'm not sure how that helps you. The second one, third one's going to take you out. Doesn't matter. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. You got to take them all together. Yeah. And the modern doctrine of the papacy was unknown in the early church. Fact. Just a fact. Then why do Orthodox scholars concede that it was known? They reject it, but they do recognize it's there in the first millennium. Why do they do that? I know you, you can't deal with it. You've got a really good chance right now. I mean, just think how many of you could go, you know, I've been led astray, but then Francis fell in the light. <laughs> we just <clears throat> we have now learned to, um, to get past all that stuff. So there's just a little bit of a discussion in regards to a discussion of Roman Catholicism that we had in the last program. Now, I want to try to, this is not easy to do, um, I guess he's shifting gears here. But I want to try to transition into a discussion of modern Roman Catholic concepts of tradition and scripture. All right, so we'll, we'll have to maybe talk about that another time. It sounds like he's he's done with my segment. Wow, two hours and 26 minutes. <laughs> went, went a lot longer than I thought we were going to, even though I sped up Dr. White. <laughs> and I wanted to speed him up to... You know, two times, but I, I, we didn't we didn't quite get to that. Put some questions in the chat. Make sure to put them to at Reason and Theology. I'll take questions for just a few minutes here, and then I gotta get out of here. Um, so put those in there. Wow, hmm. very disappointing to see the snarkiness, the arrogance, the tone. Uh, he he really took it in a very disgusting way, in my opinion. Um, and he should be ashamed of that. I think he's he's old enough to not. Um, engage in that kind of behavior, even if he feels that I've engaged in that kind of behavior. I think he should set the tone as an older, older fellow in the faith. Uh, so I'm very disappointed to see that kind of disgusting behavior. That being said, I'll still consider what he has to say because a person could be nasty all day long and still be right in what they say, right? So you still you still have to consider what a person says, even even if they deliver it in a disgusting way. Um, so let's see. Let me know what y'all's thoughts were. Do you think that that behavior was charitable? Do you think that my behavior was uncharitable? I'd like to know. Do you felt that I was uncharitable in the previous video critiquing Dr. White? You feel I was uncharitable here? Possibly. Maybe I was. I'd like to see it. I don't know how two wrongs would make a right, <laughs> but I, I, I don't think I was in the last video, so I don't know why the nasty tone in, in this one. Um, but I don't know. That's my impression of myself. I, I could be deluded. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear what y'all have to say. So, uh, let me know. I know quite a few of y'all who watch aren't, um, aren't on my side of the things. So <clears throat> you'll, you'll let me know. <laughs> uh, is this a willful ignorance at this point? I was actually discussed it at some points. Oh, well, I, I, I was too. It was kind of sickening to see that kind of behavior. Um, I don't know. It's it's hard for me to judge people's intentions and motives. It's really hard to. I after watching that, I have less confidence in his intentions. I don't. I I can't. You know, absolutely say his his intentions are are willfully ignorant. You know, um, 
he probably just thinks that there's not any other information out there. So it's not worth listening to. So that wouldn't be willful ignorance necessarily. Although it could be. Depends on what you mean there. Hmm. Uh, let's see. I feel like you could refrain from those comments. Which comments? Uh, sometimes it feels a bit ad hominem when you say doesn't have knowledge uh, or very basic knowledge. I understand that it might seem like ad hominem, but I'm willing to back it up on specific points and I bring up specific points and you'll note that he's not aware of those points in his content. Um, so I, I, I don't think that's ad hominem because I'm not speaking about him as a character as a person when i say that i'm talking about his position and his knowledge of a particular subject i don't think that that's ad hominem to say your your knowledge of a subject is deficient i, I don't think that's ad hominem i would i would think it's ad hominem to say your argument is wrong because you're a bad person that's that's ad hominem um but you say you think that we could go without those comments okay maybe maybe i'll just you know Say say what needs to be said and let it speak for itself, perhaps. You know, whenever you speak off the cuff, that's how it comes out, but maybe I could work on that. I feel Michael's always been respectful of White, given your history, you haven't been on his side before. Right. See, that's the thing. I know what White is thinking, where he's going. I I know because I've listened to a substantial amount of uh, content from Dr. White, just numerous hours. Not only of his debates, but just the, the dividing line as well, as well as his written sources and publications. Um, I know what he is thinking. I know where he's going to go with this generally. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know my position. He doesn't know where I'm going to go with something. So I have a leg up there. Enrique, I'm not surprised by his demeanor and behavior as many of his debates have shown his nature. Hmm. Um... Let's see. Hmm. James White is the best Catholic apologist on the internet. <laughs> I remember a video of him and William from RT going at it. He basically was mocking William. Who is that? That wasn't James White. That was somebody else. Um, he's repeating what he's been repeating for 30 years. It was wrong then, it was wrong now. But he thinks it was right 30 years ago. Therefore, it could be just rehashed again today. But no, he's he's not considering the full extent of of the position that's being offered in response to him. <clears throat> if the roles were reversed and White speeded a Lofton video, we would condemn that. <laughs> um, he picked the wrong fight because he was out of his league. You embarrassed him, and he showed it. Well, you know, I I don't know. I, again, I'll, I'll let y'all determine that. Um. Still looking through the chat. Um, Jose says, I know they are not ad hominem, but I can feel un unnecessarily, per oh, but it can feel unnecessarily personal at times. Maybe, maybe. Good feedback. Maybe, maybe, maybe um, yeah, I could, I could just kind of leave out the personal references to his level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. I got you. Good feedback. Um, let's see. Why do many Protestants use the councils given that they reject large parts of it? They're not they're not being inconsistent in in, in the sense that they're using a council but to refute us, but they wouldn't use it to substantiate their point. Because what they're doing is they're saying, look, you Catholics maintain these councils. Therefore, by your own standards, you're disqualified and you're refuted. They're not saying by my standards, you know, they're saying by your own standards that maintains these councils, you're refuted. So that's why they're appealing um, to councils, which is legitimate if it were accurate what they were saying. Uh all this church history does not sound nothing like the Reformed Baptist Church. Right, but somebody like White would say, yeah, I don't have to maintain that the fathers were Reformed Baptists. Okay. I also don't have to maintain that every father or every person in the first millennium um, maintained the Catholic position. I, I don't have to maintain that either. And yes, that's compatible with the language of Vatican I. 
Um, is White's ecclesiology at all consistent with what he was reading from Canon 6? If now, how does he account for that discrepancy? Because he wouldn't maintain the standards of, he wouldn't maintain the, the canons in the way that we would. So he's not trying to say, oh, I accept the canons in the way that you do, but then I reject them elsewhere. No, he doesn't believe that the canons can offer any kind of definitive judgments. He, he believes the only infallible rule is going to be scripture. And the canons are helpful, but they're not an infallible rule. They're, they're a lesser rule, but they're, they're fallible. They're reformable. Um, so that's why he can use canon six to attempt to refute us. And that's fine. That's consistent with his ecclesiology because he's not making the claims about the canons that we are. That's fine. My problem is... Yes, what he was arguing in the context in which he argued it, I maintain, was entirely irrelevant. And yes, I do believe was absurd. I maintain that. I stand by that. Absolutely. I don't take that back at all. And again, I'll, I'll let the evidence speak for itself. Where did we learn that White is Sola Nicaea? He's not. Y'all are reading too much into him. He's not. He's not. Um. He's not maintaining that as, as a rule for himself, but but he is projecting a sola Nicaea onto us and a sola canons onto us as if I have to substantiate the papacy from the canon. No, I just have to show that there's nothing in that canon that would invalidate the claims to the papacy. I don't have to show that I have to prove everything from a canon. That's not the claim of the Catholic position. He's setting up the parameters of the discussion in a way that is already a non-starter. And I don't accept that. I'm not going to let him uh, get away with that. It's not going to slide. It's not going to work with me. That might work for someone else. It won't work with me. Uh, mm, let's see. Why does White not support it, cite any scholars that support his view of the nature of Canon 6? That's an interesting question. He had an opportunity to do that here. Um, don't know why he didn't do that. Good question. Because you'll notice I did. He doesn't, though. Why is it? Not that I had to anyway. I don't have to cite any scholars. The burden of proof wasn't on me. Um, in the sense that he was assuming that it was. It wasn't. Uh, so I didn't, actually didn't even have to cite any scholars to, to back it up. Um, I, I would say the burden of proof is on him to show me how that canon goes against Vatican I's ecclesiology. Burden of proof is on him to demonstrate that and maintain that. Not me. Burden of proof is not on me. He has to substantiate that. And he didn't do it. And I showed why. Um, he arbitrarily limits the discussion to only Nicaea. Why there? Well, we, what he wants to say is that you guys claim this was known in every age, but it wasn't known at the Council of Nicaea is what he wants to claim. That's that's his argument. And as evidence for that argument was Canon 6. And I showed why that was a bad argument, and I stand by that. I'll let y'all be the judge of whether or not it was a good argument, but I stand by that. I'm not, I'm not budging on that unless he gives me a better reason to budge on that. If he gives me better reason to say that Canon 6... Um, excludes an understanding of universal ecclesiology for the Bishop of Rome and universal jurisdiction. Fine, I'll I'll reverse my my uh, position and say, hey, you were right. I'm sorry. I'll I'll do that if he can show me that. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing that, but I haven't seen it, and he had a perfect opportunity to show that. Um, capturing Christianity stream today. Cameron said he's willing to speak with you potentially next week. Would that work with your schedule? Ugh. Ugh. It's really the next two weeks that I'm slammed. Um, every day I'm booked. Um, uh, first day open is May 22nd. And that's a Sunday. I try to not do shows on Sunday, but I'm... Uh, I'd be willing to, um, if that's the only option. Other than that, the earliest option is May 27th, uh, which is a Friday. So I don't know. If, if he wants to reach out, that, that's fine. Uh, that's why I did this, um, because I, I know I'm not really going to have the opportunity. Uh, was that a Modelo? No, I, th I think it's the same people who make Modelo, though, right? Corona Extra. 
I rarely um get an opportunity to drink wine or beer, but I had one whenever I had William in studio. He got these uh, Corona extras, and it was actually pretty good. So I said, hey, let me go get one of them. I rarely get the opportunity. I mostly drink um, water or coffee. That tends to be my thing. <laughs> I'm a coffee a coffee holic, I, I guess. Um, hmm. Let's see. This is your job now, Lofton. Do work, son. Right, but but the thing is, I'm I'm working on my dissertation now, working on the book for Catholic Answers. In addition to the show, in addition to also um, doing the outreach here in the chapel. So I mean, there's there's just a lot of things that I'm doing all you know and and that's just in you know um more more my professional life right still have my family life and everything so i feel i'm busier now than i'm doing this full time than i was when i was doing rnt in my full time job well that's also because i've taken on additional additional responsibilities so mm. i feel like there are less streams since you quit you might be right about that you might be right, but overall, I'm getting more done. Also, I was really killing myself <laughs> doing doing both like that. I was really killing myself. Um, don't you have a book to write? Yeah, I, I should have been writing it tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Doctor White. <laughs> Thanks for putting out that that review. Um, yeah. Uh, Sean Matthew, thank you for the super chat. When is there a grave enough pressure to put on the Pope where his magisterial decisions would become invalid? Is it only when it's a threat of death? I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, hmm. Does it have to be specifically a threat of death? Not necessarily. Um, any kind of significant force, really. That, that doesn't have to necessarily result in the loss of life. I mean, for example, you could have a significant pressure of a loss of limb. That doesn't kill you, right? But would that, would that invalidate the legitimacy of, of something that's promulgated by the Pope if it's under that kind of duress? Of course it would. Of course it would. It's not free, right? It just needs to be free. Um, anything that is impeding that, yeah. Uh, good question. Uh, let's see. Mm, I'm currently Lutheran and very interested in Catholicism. I recently started praying the rosary. I've heard that the rosy beads can be cursed if purchased from the wrong place. I think you're 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 talking about like if it's if it's purchased from a Satanist or something like that. Um, look, the power of Christ is greater than the power of the devil. You just um, have a priest bless it, and the power of Christ is greater than anything. Uh, that the devil curses. Um, will your book be made of cardboard? Nice, nice, nice. Uh, in terms of scholarship, these guys really rely heavily on the 19th century Anglicans, Salmon, Whitaker, good, low hanging fruit for future consideration. Mm. Mm. Um, when Bertuzzi learns that Pope Francis is the current Pope, it might be game over. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, I came back to communion with Rome under the pontificate of Pope Francis. So no, I, I don't I don't think that that has to be a deal breaker. Um, He said it was a joke. <laughs> it, got, it got a laugh out of me. <laughs> but you never know these days, right? <laughs> I think a conversation between Mike and Cameron would be edifying to a lot of non-Catholics on the cusp. Yeah, I think it would be fun. Um, let's see. Did I get everything from the chat? Was that all? Did you have any questions specifically about the content that was discussed? Canon 6, um, any of the arguments I used, anything Dr. White said, um, anything specifically on, on that? If not, I'll just kill the stream here in a minute because it's already been... Again, we've gone Lord of the Rings length here at two hours and 45 minutes. That's, gosh, that's a, we could have literally watched 
Lord of the Rings in the amount of time that I did this video. <laughs> <laughs> source for athanasius yes go go and watch it in the video that i did but um that the um the source was the primary source is quoted um directly in the giles book he gives you the primary source in there which i went also and verified in in the primary sources itself uh which is part of the shaft series but um, yeah, go, go get Giles, which, which is available online for free. And if you watch the video I did on Athanasius and his vision, version of, or an understanding of the papacy, I put a link in the description to Giles's uh, work in PDF. So a free, free version of it since it's on archive.org. Um, so yeah, ch check that out. I think I even put the page number and everything on there. Um... Uh, which book by Giles? It's it's the documents illustrating papal authority. You know, up up until the time of um, from the first century until uh, the end of the reign of Pope Leo. Um, anything else? What became of the Patriarch of of Alexandria? <laughs> Is he the Coptic Patriarch today? Hmm. Actually, um, there's there's some question about their succession, the Coptic succession. Um, so there 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 is a dispute there. There's also, um, of course, a dispute on the succession of the Byzantine version of the Patriarch of Alexandria. And here, by Byzantine, let me rephrase: the Eastern Orthodox version, right? Um, the Chalcedonian uh lineage if you will there there's there's also some question there um, all right well i think that's it mm, we'll uh we'll go ahead and end it there um appreciate y'all watching thank y'all for hanging out here for two hours and 45 minutes <laughs> It's a long time, y'all. Hey, look, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Hit that like button. Share this on your social media. Uh, let people know about this so that there is awareness that there is content out there engaging uh, Protestant claims about the papacy. Make sure to share it. And, uh, of course, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. See you later. God bless. Hey, RNC fans, just a quick word from our sponsor. Be sure to check out realestateforlife.org if you want to sell a home or buy a home and you want to use an agent who shares your perspective about the pro-life cause. Make sure to check them out, realestateforlife.org, to support the pro-life movement and your choice to sell or purchase a home. God bless.